up onto your feet. I want us to do two, two things before we start worship. Two, two things. The first one. I know yesterday Pastor Kilonzi told us to celebrate our movement leaders and all those people. My pastor, allow me to celebrate another group. Thank you. So, in every single campus or every single network, there are some people we never celebrate or they are always forgotten. But they are the guys who run the wheels in all of our campuses. Do you understand that? So, if there is a campus administrator here, campus administrator, celebrate them. And if, if you are seated next to someone who works in the operations office, those guys are very important. Remember them, remember them. When you pray, you pray for them twice. Your requisition has to go through, guys. Your requisition has to go through. Now, the second thing that I want us to do is I want to teach you guys a new song. New song. Uh, we haven't done this in a while. I haven't done this in a while. But it's simple. All we'll be saying is demonstrate power demonstrate the anointing Lord demonstrate wonders in this place let's do it again demonstrate power Demonstrate the anointing. Demonstrate wonders in this place. Very nice. Let's try it one more time. Demonstrate power. Demonstrate power. Demonstrate the anointing. Demonstrate wonders in this place. Thank you, guys. Thank you for being an amazing worship team. And as we begin, as we begin, fist bump someone, fist bump someone. We are about to get down. Your neighbor and tell him this is the day the Lord has made. This is the day the Lord has made. I will rejoice and be glad in this. I will rejoice and be glad in this. Come, come, come to the front. Come, come, come to the come, come, come to the put, put your hands together. Put your, put your hands together. Come on, somebody. Hey. 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 And the people of God say, yeah.
so I have the honor and privilege, honor and privilege of introducing my in-laws. Did you people know? Oh, my mother. The other ones are my in-laws. <laughs> but I have the honor and privilege of introducing the one and only. Demon Chaser. Giant Slayer. Deliverer of blessings. The one and only Pastor Sionen. position eh? like this hey
because he is worthy. He deserves all the praise. Come on, scream somebody. It's such an honor and privilege to lead all of you in worship. I don't take it for granted. I don't get this chance a lot of times, but when I do, it's a show. But, so yesterday, while our papa was speaking, he kept on saying that we are the change makers. And today when Pastor Milton, like a big house, said, we have the power, we have the power to set everything right in every single situation. Come on, come on. So I want you to think about that difficult situation you have. Maybe it might be in your family. It might be in our relationships, our friends, or as a married couple. Whichever relationship it is, think about it. Or it might just be the storm that is within you. And you're going through it and you keep on asking yourself, who will come and save me? The truth is this, because we have Christ, we have the power. You don't need another person to come and change it. It needs you to pray. It needs you to pray. So where you are, let's just start worshiping him. Bring up that situation. The atmosphere will change because of you. The demons will bow down to the name of Jesus. Not to your situation. So let's just worship him. Father, you deserve it. Father, you deserve it. You deserve it. It's a new song, God. But all we are declaring is the atmosphere has changed. Because you're here Even the dumb will speak Because you're here Even the dead will rise Because you're here Because you're here Because you're here Because you're here The blind will see Even the blind will see Because you're here The dumb will begin to speak will rise. Even the dead will rise because you're here. Yeah. And we prepare an atmosphere. We prepare an atmosphere for you to move. My God. The blind will begin to see. Even the blind will see. Because you're here, the deaf will hear. Even the deaf will hear because you're here. The dead situation will rise. Even the dead will rise because you're here. We prepare an atmosphere. And we
You sing. Demon. Demonstrate. The anointing is flowing. Wonders. Signs. Demonstrate power, Father. Because we are here. Demonstrate. Demonstrate. So, for some, for some, you've just been asking, Lord, when will you show up? You just don't know because you are there, He has shown up. For some of us, it's difficult. For some of us, it's difficult. And standing here, and all I'm praying for is for healing for my brother. So right now, because I've sung that song, the Lord will demonstrate on my behalf. We need him to demonstrate wherever we are in our discipleship groups in our congregation in our homes in our aces wherever we are the spirit is there so lord demonstrate your power because of who you are
this is just a spontaneous moment of worship. I just want you to focus on God, the author and the finisher of our faith this morning. Thank you for the miracles that you have experienced this morning. Let every other thing fade away. Let your problems, let your situations, let your circumstance fade away. And focus on Jesus. Focus on Jesus. Just lift up those hands in God's presence this morning. Lift up those hands in God's presence this morning. And say, Father, we surrender. Father, we worship you this morning. Let all the other names fade away. Let all the other names fade away. Till the only Let all the other names fade away. Jesus, Jesus, stay. Right here in Mavuno Church, Jesus, take your place. away and there was no longer any sea 
And I saw the holy city and new Jerusalem carrying out of heaven from God, prepared as a bride, beautifully dressed for her husband. And then I heard a loud voice from the throne saying, Look, God's dwelling place is now among people and he will dwell with them. They will be his people and God himself will be with them and be their God. And he will wipe every tear from their eyes. There will be no more death or mourning or crying or pain for the old order of things has passed away. And then he who was seated on the throne said, I am making everything new. I don't know whether you guys realize that when we say his presence is heaven to us, this is what we are saying. We are saying that God is making everything new. We are saying that there are no more tears, no more pain, no more sorrow. As in, we are saying that the kingdom of heaven has come on earth. And that we are running through a dress rehearsal of what that will look like. I don't know guys. We said we are creating an atmosphere. You guys don't understand. You see, the writer John says also in Revelation that they conquered the enemy by the words of their testimony as part of the combination. I don't know whether Pastor James is here. Is Pastor Jemo here? Jemo, come running. Birthday boy. Yes, yes, come, 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 Jemo, come, Jemo. Even Jesus says that the Holy Spirit will not speak of himself. He'll speak of Jesus. Senior, so I do not want to speak of myself and for myself. Jemo, something happened on Tuesday when you and I were walking. Because I want us to go into a place of prayer. And I want your faith, I want your faith to grow. Sawa, sawa. So Jemo, on Tuesday, campus pastors meeting, yeah. we left going so, to where no one can help us. What happened? <laughs> so I was walking with Pastor Milton. Uh, we were meeting, our meeting was at MYF. And as we were walking out, I, I asked him, are you limping? I asked him, do you have an injury? Because I noticed he was, he was walking like he has a limp. So Pastor Milton said to me, you've never noticed. I told him no. So he said to me, uh, my left leg is shorter than my right leg. And it was weird because I'd never known. Uh, and I've never noticed and I've taken many walks with him. And so he said to me, okay, my, my left leg is a little shorter, so there's a way I walk. He even told me that's even why I sort of have a bit of a stoop to the side. I was like, okay, I think I've kind of noticed that. So he said it's because, you know, there's that difference. And then something interesting happened yesterday morning. Yeah, um, please we tell were them. hosting Pastor Trevor from Avuno Blantyre. Mm. And, uh, you know, we live not too far from here. And so uh, we decided with Pastor Trevor, we want to come early and pray before we started prayers officially at 6. And so at about 10 to 5, we were walking, because I think we were here a few minutes past 5. And as we are walking, Pastor Trevor said to me, God is saying that there's someone who has one leg that's shorter than the other, and he's going to make it grow today. And he said, that person, it causes them backache. So when Pastor Trevor told me that I didn't tell him anything, I was like, okay, I was in this conversation yesterday, and now I'm in this conversation today. I said, okay, let me see what the Lord will do. And so at the end, when Pastor Milton finished praying for us this morning, uh, I went to and whispered to Pastor Trevor, and I said to him, there's something you told me yesterday morning. And I said to him, I think that word is for Pastor Milton. Uh, because on Tuesday, I found out uh, that he has one leg that's shorter than the other. And so after the prayers, I think when guys were going out for breakfast, because Pastor Milton is the one who was leading, we waited for him to finish. And Pastor Trevor made him sit right here. And he said, we're going to pray for you. And, you know, I called Pastor Godi. Pastor Godi came and stood with us. I came and stood behind Pastor Milton. And as Pastor Milton was sitting, uh, you know, this is the leg that was shorter. And I was holding this leg as we were praying. And guys, this leg stretched three times. Oh my God! I felt it. Thank you, Jesus. I felt hey. it. Hey. He didn't. He didn't tell me. I was holding his leg. 
and I felt it stretch, and I felt it stretch again, and I felt it stretch at that time. God is here. So first, just open up your mouths. Thank you, Pastor James. And begin thanking God that he's here and that he's working. Begin thanking God that you are here. You are in this place. And you are here and you are working. That the spirit is not hovering. That the spirit is at work. That in the chaos that are here, the spirit is at work. So begin praying and saying to God, God, you are here. God, you are here. God, you are here. And I thank you, you are here. I thank you, you've honored us with your presence. I thank you that with your presence, the kingdom of God has come here. That with your presence, the kingdom of God is here. That with your presence, the government of the kingdom is reigning in this place. Begin telling God, thank you for what you are already doing. Thank you for what you have done. Thank you. Begin thanking him. I don't know if there's anyone with a testimony. I don't know if there's anyone with a testimony while we were praying. I would want to take one or two if there is any. I want to take one or two if there is any. And then we can make a prayer. Is there anyone with a testimony of something that's happened to them? Uh, praise church. Uh, uh, praise church again. Uh, so, last week, uh, my mama liniambia her dad alikuwa na brain tumor. So, it um, affected. Last week, uh, his, his mom told him that uh, their dad had a brain tumor. Yes. So, So as I was sharing with Pasi Soki, you'll make it stretch. We'll wait. We'll wait. We'll wait to see. Tutangoja, tutangoja. affected my grandfather until his eyes were popping out of their socket. So this other side Adima in a talker. So when my mom showed me the picture me Gilkona Filinka God a mitwacha. But um, he felt like God had left them because his grandfather's eyes were popping out of their socket. So after a conversation with my mom, uh, I found my mom crying. So I was like, God, I've served you all these years. Why should you so, leave me? Why should you forsake me now? That year we came Zima ilikuwa full of tremendous and ilikuwa, but God ni God. Mama likuja kanyambia. They tried their best. So, me and Ilkwana expect Kwambiwa. Ilkwana negativity, he but. I was expecting a negative report. But Mama Limiambia, they, they managed. And. Na thank God, na thank God, Sana. So. Thanks, God. Even this week, I. Soki call, I remember Soki calling me and asking me, Will you, will you come? Ah. Uh, I put aside all things and I decided I'll come this week wow. fully. Wow. Wow. Father, we thank you for Clifford's granddad. And right now we are dissolving that tumor right now from his granddad's head right now. That Lord God, by the sprinkling of faith of the blood of Jesus over his brain, 
over Lord God his head right now Father we are declaring a shrinking and a diminishing and a dissolving of that tumor to the honor and glory of your name that doctors will wonder what happened but it's because the great physician himself Jesus Christ our Lord the King of Kings the Lord of Lords the one on whom is the is the Lord over all flesh where there is no difficulty in him father we declare that Tunchi's grandpa is well right now. Father, we declare peace upon his body right now. Father God, we pray that wherever he is, put him into a sleep right now. Put him into a sleep right now. And Lord God, we pray that the same way you put Adam to sleep, and Lord God, you removed something from him, and he woke up without even having a wound. Father, we are praying for Tunchi's grandpa, operate on him, remove that tumor, O King of Kings, and we pray that when he will awake from that sleep, that Lord God, the entire tumor will have gone away in Jesus' name. Amen. 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 <clears throat> so my, my testimony is um, <sighs> today at 3.30 I was woken up by screams in the house. It was one person screaming. It was my brother. So I was upstairs. There's only three of us in the house. Me, my brother, and the son. So when I went down, I found that he, the boy was fitting. He was fitting. In fact, when I touched him, I saw he was gone. He was gone. Oh, wow. I looked and I saw he's gone. <laughs> so I decided to go upstairs. So my brother is one I'm trying to contain. I'm telling him because he's not a believer. Stop screaming because you're going to scare whatever is left of him. Yeah. He's screaming. He's rolling on the ground. Yeah. Uh, the, uh, the little boy is feeding. Yeah. And let me tell you, so that you know the devil is alive, the lights are flickering. Oh, wow. I'm in a full hell scene. Oh, wow. So I go back upstairs. I can even see my brother kneeling sometimes to, between the rolling on the ground, the screaming. I can see him kneeling sometimes to pray. But when I went upstairs, I asked God, what should I do? God told me, no, this is no time to pray, to, to go on your knees. Grace, declare. Declare. So I said, today I will see victory. I went... Sometimes those who know me know that I misplaced my keys a lot. The keys were on top of the handbag and I knew the angels had kicked in. Yes. So I picked the keys. By the time I went down, he had stopped fitting and I could hear him breathing. <laughs> then we got into the car, drove him to Karen Hospital. And he's okay. In fact, they're on their way home. But this is what I want to say. There was a message there for me. And it was just the full hell scene flickering. Even the street lights were flickering at that point. And God said to me, Grace, this is hell. Hell has no breaks. This is what Pastor M is talking about on stage. People are going to die. People in Karen are going to die if you don't arise. And so I told the Lord, thank you for giving me minutes in hell. Even the lights were flickering. They were screaming. Some were dying. But God, I promise you, from this moment, 
I never, I never said like Pastor Godwin or Kilonzi, give me this area or I die. I said this area is going to regret I was born. Amen. It's going to regret I was born. Amen. Amen. Father, we pray for Pastor Grace that Lord God, as she steps out into Karen, that Lord God, the glory of God will come upon Karen. And Lord God, as it is told by the prophet Isaiah in Isaiah 32 and from verse 15 going onwards, Lord, that because of the spirit of God being in grace and upon Pastor Grace, and because of the power of the Holy Spirit being at work in that area, as Lord God, we open up current for your influence, that the desolate spaces and the desolate spirits and the desolate people in current will become like a fertile field. And that fertile field, Lord God, we declare will be like a forest. And that, Lord God, your people in Karen will live in peaceable dwellings. And that, Lord God, it will not just because it's the leafy suburbs, but because of the forest of the presence of God in that area. And Lord God, right now we speak a takeover of Karen in the name of Jesus. A takeover of Karen, Lord God, in the name of Jesus. We declare Karen for Jesus right now. We declare Karen for Jesus right now. Lord God, we violently take it, oh God. Father, from the stronghold of the evil one. And Lord God, every stronghold in Karen, come down in the name of Jesus. Every argument in Karen that comes against the knowledge of God, come down right now in the name of Jesus. Every high place, every principality, every power, come down right now in the name of Jesus. For the glory of God has come. For the glory of God has arisen. And Lord God, we pray right now that even this blessing we pray over Karen, we pray over each and every part of this movement right now. Current and future. And Lord God, we put Africa on notice. We put Americas on notice. We put Europe on notice. We put Asia on notice. We put the Aussies and New Zealand on notice. The glory of the Lord has come and you are not going to stop it. For the revival has been set up and the fire has been lit and the gospel is spreading in the name of Jesus. In the name of Jesus. Amen. Amen. Pasis, you, you have something to share. Wow. Thank you, Pastor Grace. Hi. Um, about two weeks ago, I started to have pain in my thumb. I hadn't fallen. I hadn't twisted it. It, it was just sudden. And every day it got worse. At some point on Monday, it was swollen. Yeah, so I almost couldn't use this hand. I couldn't carry a thing with it. Anyway, so yesterday when Pastor M said today there is a healing service, I just <laughs> felt a witness in my spirit to pray for um to to pray and receive a creative miracle for a new thumb. And as I speak now, I twist it, I turn it. It's not swollen. There's nothing. <laughs> wow. Wow. To God be the glory. To God be the glory. Um, mine uh, goes way back in December. I have been unwell and I've had a situation that's a bit sensitive to give the details since December. And um, it got worse two weeks before we planted Mavunurungai.
Even as they continue singing, it's okay, you can just sing. That you've been in a depressive space. And I'm not saying this again to shame you. I believe it's because there's a sweet anointing here. You even sort of became suicidal. You had suicidal thoughts. I want to pray with you for deliverance right now. By the way, it's not to shame you. It's not to shame you. Please just come. Just come. Just come, please. If this is you, the Lord is here. The Lord is here. God is here. The Lord is here. Just come. Oh, yes, Just come. He is here. Just come. He Just come. Here. Come before the Lord. You can kneel. If you are among those who've moved to the front because of suicidal Where thoughts, just kneel. Just kneel wherever you are. There's a sweet anointing here. There is a sweet anointing. There is a sweet anointing. There is. Believe me, there is an anointing in this sanctuary today. Please do not be left out. It's not to shame you. It's not to shame you, good people. It's not to shame you. To heal the wounded heart and bless the poor. kneeling at Mavuno Hill City Campus. They are kneeling before the throne of grace where Lord God you've given us an assurance that you've given us mercy and help and grace in our time of need. So Lord God you who's the lifter of our soul. You Lord God who's the one who takes away the burdens of our hearts. You oh God who ministers to our emotions, to our will, to our longings, to our desires. I invite you to minister to your people right now. And right now, may depression lift from your people right now. May depression lift from your people right now. May hopelessness lift from your people right now. May self-doubt, Lord God, lift from your people right now. May, Lord God, low self-esteem lift from your people right now. Father God, right now we speak, Lord God, that any lie of the enemy, any deceptive spirit, any spirit of fear, any spirit, Lord God, that has come upon them to torment them, I command you, live right now in the name of Jesus. Live right now in the name of Jesus. Live right now in the name of Jesus. And go to Jesus right now. Go to Jesus where he will deal with you as he pleases. Yes, I'm commanding you to live. I'm commanding you to live right now. As in, leave. I want none of you to remain, you lying spirit. Leave God's people right now. These bodies were created as a temple of the Holy Spirit. They were not created for anything else. So leave. Leave. And know something. If you don't leave, I'm calling upon you the fire of the Holy Spirit. So leave. So leave. So Father, I invite your Holy Spirit of promise upon your people. That you who gives us a spirit of love, of boldness, and of a sound mind. Father God, you who lives, gives us a spirit of self-discipline, a spirit of soberness, a spirit of self-control. May that come upon your people right now in the name of Jesus. 
and Lord God, I reclaim their identity in God. Their identity as children of God. Their identity as sons of God. That they will not be defined by anything else. But they will only be defined by their identity as children of God. So Lord God, I disconnect them from any communication from the underworld, the netherworld, the the mediums of darkness I disconnect them now in the name of Jesus I disconnect any voice that is a deceitful voice from them in the name of Jesus I disconnect them Lord God from any communication that seeks to give them an identity other than the identity in God I disconnect them right now and Lord God I remove any dart, any traumatic dart, any traumatic spear any traumatic arrow Lord God of the enemy I remove it from them I remove it from them Lord God that those pain those painful situations those situations that cause them this thing oh God is coming out of them and they will remember it no more I disconnect them from their past Lord God that is hurting them the past that people have let them down expectations that were unmet and the frustrations that came father I disconnect them right now from those things in the name of Jesus and Lord God right now I declare a newness of life 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 Come out of her! Come out! Come out! Come out right now in the name of Jesus! And Lord God, we declare the peace of God. We declare the peace of God right now. We declare the peace of God right now. We declare the peace of God right now. So Lord God, upon your people, may peace prevail and may the glory of God come. In Jesus' name, amen. Pastor M, you'll still preach. By the way, uh, when this happens, you know you're not living at three, we are living at whatever time. <laughs> Um, so, yeah, so I, I've had two doctor's appointments, both shown nothing. We've done all sorts of tests. And so my husband and I concluded that um, this is not physical, this is spiritual. Um, <laughs> It's beyond human imagination or human understanding or even the human eye. And I shared with Pastor Angie and we prayed about it. And last week, I also shared with Pastor Caro. And we also prayed about it and we've been praying with her. And on Tuesday, we had a meeting and Pastor Trevor made a prayer and said, he actually stopped the meeting midway and he said he feels in his spirit that we need to pray for healing and I received it God used him I received it and straight away Pastor Caro came to me and held my hand and we prayed yesterday in the morning Pastor Jemo did the morning prayers and what I'm trying to say is, I am meant to be here. The word is mine. I received it. Pastor Jemo prayed and three times, subconsciously, I don't know, he mentioned the woman with the issue of blood. And I took that prayer and I took that word. Again, I received healing. And, you know, every time I kept on, you know, because I even forgot I was unwell yesterday. And so I went and checked, and at around lunchtime, we were with Pasis and uh, Pastor Zedi. And I told them, guess what? Whatever it is, is not there anymore. <laughs> Jesus! <laughs> and I thank God. 
because I received it. I received Pastor Angie. I received Pastor Caro. I received my husband as prophets. And I took the prophet's reward and I have received healing. And I thank God. I am so grateful. I am healed. Father, we thank you for Nyambura. Lord God, we thank you for your wonder-working power and grace in her life. And Lord God, we declare right now that you who began this good work, would you bring it to a completion in Christ Jesus our Lord. And we declare that issue removed in the name of Jesus. And that Lord God, the only thing she will have are the ones every chick would have. And Lord God, therefore we declare today that Nyambura, you are fully and completely healed. In Jesus name, Amen. For you are great, you the miracle so great, there is no can understand the burden of having a sibling that is not prospering and you are not there like to walk him through the faith and to you know hold his hand when he's having uh, difficult times and we are all all over the world by the way so uh, today I've been praying for my brother my brother he's not a young man he's 35 he's not married he's, 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 and he's very single by the way and I'm looking for a wife for him <laughs> anyway he's single He's, he, he, in his workplace, he's not prospering. Like, there's just difficulty. And we can all tell that there's a curse over him. Like, I've, I've told anybody that says, how can I pray for you? I forget about myself and start praying for my brother. I say, please pray for my brother. And while he was growing up, you could just tell that this one, there's a stronghold over his life. This morning again, while we were praying, I started praying for him. And Pastor Milton said, he, you said a word that for me. I've been asking God, how do I pray? Maybe I'm praying a miss. You know, there are times when I pray for him, I see him in a cage and he's not able to come out. There are times that I've seen different things about him and I keep praying and telling him and he's, he's very slow to accommodate in the faith. He says, I go to church, it's fine. So, um, this morning while you were praying, you said every written code, every written ordinance, immediately so like the Lord opened my eyes and I saw it was like a Chinese writing on a flag. And there were two of them. Immediately they caught up in flames and just burnt, got burnt and in ashes. And I said, and I started asking God, what are those? And I heard in my spirit, that is what was written about your brother and about your sister. It's finished, it's done. So I, I bless God for that. You do miracles so great. There is no one else like you. amazing that I'm able to start throughout worship. I have been having a back kick for some time such that uh, when I come to church for instance I'm not able to start throughout the worship session but this morning I came out for prayer and I the pain was still there when I went back to sit but as we were worshiping I suddenly felt some something happening and I started touching my back just to confirm that uh, it's <laughs> it not there. there. It's the back that is there. <laughs> yeah. The pain is not there. And I think my testimony has been delayed until this moment to confirm that I can start throughout. And wow. I am here. Yeah. Wow. I am here.
came by the blood of a lamp and by the word of our testimony. Yeah. Yeah. And this on, sun, on Sunday, I woke up with a terrible headache. And, um, and my back and was paining. I could not lift my hand. And half of my body could, was, I felt a lot of, it was weak. But I said, you know what, devil, I'm going to go to church and all that. I came on, yes, on Tuesday. I'd come to Tuesday, on Tuesday. I couldn't lift up my hands. Um, and then I noticed that my half of my body was cold. One half was hot and one half was cold. But I told myself, I just kept, I didn't tell my wife anything. I didn't tell nobody. I was just praying and believing God. And yesterday, Pastor M said that there's some people that are having problems with sleeping. I've been having serious problems with sleeping. The first testimony was that I was telling my children because they were having a video conversation with me as I said I wanted to go and sleep. I slept, I was already feeling sleepy at 8. Wow. I woke up, the alarm, the alarm woke me up at 4, 4.15. I turned it off, I left, I slept, slept again. again. Wow. So that was the first testimony. But today, I needed to confirm the testimony and, and right now, the pain is gone. I'm feeling completely gone. And I can lift up my hands. I, I intentionally came out to dance with the people outside to, to give glory to God and shame the devil. I lifted this hand. This hand, I could not lift it up this way. And I'm really grateful to God because it's perfecting all that concerns me. Hear me? Our Father and our God, we just want to declare that Lord God, Yemi's body yes, Lord. is fully reordered in the name of Jesus. That his nervous system yes, is functional yes, the way it ought to. That Lord God, every place of numbness, every headache, Lord God, is removed right now in the name of Jesus. And Lord God, we declare right now a flowing of the waters of the rivers of the Holy Spirit from the top of his head right now. Taking away every dirt, every dross, everything, Lord God, from him. Moving down, Lord God, his chest, his abdomen, Lord God, up to his feet. And Lord God, we declare that this cleansing, refreshing power of the Holy Spirit would make his body completely whole. And that Lord God... Yemi will be fitter than he has ever been. That Lord God, he will, Lord God, just worship you in the beauty of your holiness, in your splendor, Lord God, and majesty that you've shown in him and through him. So behold your son. Do him well in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. I need to invite Pastor Trevor to say something. And then invite Pastor Moreni to uh, come and do his thing. Otherwise, we won't live here at this rate. Pastor Trevor. Yeah. You know, I always do this when the Spirit just comes over me. I just feel the love of God. And He loves each one of you so much. And I felt like God was saying that right now, if you've been chasing your miracle, your time is over. Yeah, if, if you have been waiting for that miracle and you are still waiting, you are denying yourself the breakthrough right now. No longer will you wait. You will stand in breakthrough in the name of Jesus. And I declare it over you right now. Yeah, there, there's no longer will you stay in sickness. Sickness can no longer touch you. Yeah. In the beginning of the year, in 2020, I declared over my family that no spirit of infirmity would touch them and nobody was sick the entire year. Do you believe it over yourself? Now is your chance to declare it over yourself and your family right now. Yeah. Yeah, if you are sick or wounded or hurting or in pain, this is your day of breakthrough. If you want to suffer in silence, you are choosing to rest in your sin. No longer can you do that because you've been redeemed. You are covered by the blood of Jesus. Yeah? I will pray for you. I will pray for hours for you. I will never stop until we see the breakthrough. 
Because that is the God that we worship. Yeah? If you've been seeking that miracle, it's time for you to lay down your, lay down your unbelief and pick up your shield of faith in the name of Jesus. Yeah? yeah? No longer. I refuse to let you accept mediocrity as your portion. Yeah? It's time for you to receive the impartation that our Father, our spiritual Father gave you yesterday. Yeah? You don't use it as a note. You put it in your heart and you live it every day. So if you have sickness or pain in any capacity, it's time for you to lay that down. I want to pray for you. I want to pray with you. I want to cry with you. I want to rejoice with you. And I know that there are many people standing right next to you that want the same thing. If we want to see revival, that spirit inside you will rebirth right now in Jesus' name. Yeah? The last time I did this, I held on a microphone for seven hours. I promise, Pastor Em, I won't do it again. All right? But I just love God so much. And I see you. I look around, and I know you've seen me staring at you, and I apologize, but I see Christ in each one of you, and it's beautiful. And I just want to pray for you guys right now. I want to pray breakthrough over you. I want to pray the spirit of prophecy, the anointing that has been given, that I told this man yesterday, he has it. I'm telling you right now, if you want to see the next man that's going to bring breakthrough, I'm standing right next to him. And if you want that anointing, freely received, freely given. Yeah, so let's, I just want to pray for you guys. I've been praying this entire time for this anointing to fall, the Joel 2 anointing, right now. And I've been holding my tongue, waiting for this moment, and I want to honor Pastor M for giving me space to share what's on my heart. And I just, I just love you guys so much. I'm so honored to be a part of this family. So I just, I want to pray for you guys right now. So Father, oh, Dad, these, this is my family. This is my brothers and sisters in Christ, the soldiers that stand for truth, justice, the sake of the gospel, to seek the lost, Lord. So Lord, we just loose the anointing of prophecy in the name of Jesus. We loose the anointing of healing in the name of Jesus. Lord, I speak breakthrough in this place in Jesus' name. We are standing on a powder keg of glory, Lord, and that spark has been lit right now. And we refuse to allow mediocrity to encapsulate us when we leave. We will live a life of overcoming right now in Jesus' name. So Lord, I speak breakthrough in each one of their lives right now in the name of Jesus. I speak healing into their families in Jesus' name. I don't care if it's an uncle. I don't care if it's a, a grandfather. I don't care who it is. Every person they're touched will be anointed by the fullness of the Spirit because they will walk in the Spirit in every circumstance, Lord. I speak that blessing over them right now in Jesus' name. In Jesus' name, I bless them. Lord and as they go they will be a blessing to every person if you want to see evangelism watch these people walk out this door watch these people walk into the brokenness of this world as light that cannot be quenched you will see floods of darkness fleeing in the name of Jesus bless us oh God as we continue to learn continue to move but Lord that we will not learn for our heads but our hearts ache to put into practice what we've learned bless us oh God as we go Come, Holy Spirit, and be our strength as we move into this world. We are the bringers of hope. In Jesus' name, amen. Thank you, bro. Um, yeah, I want us to take a tea break, but uh, before that, uh, I want us to just make this declaration in this song. And my prayer for you is that you will sing this song as your prayer and that the Holy Spirit will say of you and say of me that a body have I found for myself that I may do your will. So sing this song as your declaration, as your prayer. And then I'll invite Pastor M to just close this session uh, and then we'll be given the next instruction. So sing this song as your prayer. So as our...
you know it. And I'll provide the sacrifice. You provide the spirit. You provide the spirit. much you love him right now this is your daddy he's here I love you daddy this is worth it spending the day in your house is worth it this is much better than being anywhere better better one day in your court than a thousand elsewhere Lord I love you I love you daddy you're such a good father you do all things well we bless you Jesus we love you Lord thank you for filling us up Lord thank you for your healing Thank you for your miracles. Thank you for everything that you give us, Lord. Thank you that we don't have to earn it. Thank you that you've already given it. We love you, Lord. We give you thanks for every testimony that has happened. We give you thanks for every testimony that will happen. We thank you for every testimony that is happening right now. We bless you, Jesus. We bless you, Jesus. We thank you, Lord. We honor you, Lord. You're such an amazing God. You're such an amazing God. We bless you, Lord. And Lord, even as we just sit down to receive, 
We pray that, Lord, your word would be spirit and life. We need the spirit and we need your life. And so I'm praying today that there will be a double impartation. That, Lord Jesus, you take everything and fill us up with it, Lord. And that, Lord Jesus, you would, Lord, I pray that people would not even be able to sleep tonight. <laughs> not because of illness, but because of encounter with the Holy Spirit. I pray that, Lord Jesus, you'd pour out your gifts. Just pour out your gifts upon your children, Lord. And I pray that, Father God, every one of us would say, better is one day, four days in your courts. Yes, God. Than spending them anywhere else apart from here. Yes, Jesus. And so, Lord, we love you. We bless you. We honor you. We thank you. You're such an amazing Father. And we pray all these things in the mighty and matchless name of our Lord and Savior, Jesus God's people say, Amen. 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 Wow. 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 Woo. Please have your seats if you can. <laughs> wow. You know, I had people once saying, please have your seats if you can. And today it's, it's true for sure. I was almost like, Pastor Milton, just keep, let's just keep being in God's presence. Let's just listen to his presence. Isn't that amazing? By the way, you probably have a friend who thought they were busy and they had to work. You need to tell them to come tomorrow. For real. It's like, what job could you do that could, could compare with your back being healed and you being able to raise your hand? Like, how long will you work to pay doctors and the Holy Spirit is here? You know? So, by the way, have mercy on your people in your DGs. If they're not here, just tell them, please, just cancel. Come. <laughs> Come. By the way, guys, we say it at the beginning of the year, we seek first. Come on. Yeah, we seek first. And, and, and I, I, I remember, I just want to honor um, my good friend, Ruben. Uh, Ruben, if you could just wave. Uh, Ruben is uh, in charge of um, discipleship groups here. He's been helping Pastor James, works as one of his pastors here. He's bivocational. And, he, and I, made, I, made a, I, I just said it in passing at Hill City. I said, look, if you, have a hard, if you have a hard situation and you can't get time off work, just go tell your boss that you have a function at church you need to attend. He took it as a word of the prophet. Wow. And he went and talked to his hard boss and said, I need to go for a church meeting. <laughs> for four days <laughs> and his boss said go yeah. just go <laughs> so so guys we have to move into the realm of boldness Amen. yeah we have to move into the realm where we stop being afraid yeah Biazo. yeah just take it by force what's the worst they can do is say no isn't it yeah. and tell them by the way if I, if four days of me praying for this business versus me sitting here just typing on the computer just compare be serious prophets when I'm praying for this business. Yeah, for real. Sumit, if you remember, we used to do that in our Mizizi retreats, didn't we? We'd actually tell all our Mizizi graduates, go and tell your boss, you're going to be praying for them when they give you that day off to go on retreat. And inevitably, we'd get a 100% turnout. So let's, 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 start let's start leading our discipleship groups to be bold. Let's start leading them to desire God's presence, more than anything. Guys, let me tell you, this four-day investment is better than anything you could do this year. Being here is it's setting, it's commanding your year. Right. You're commanding your year. Yeah. So, so if you've got friends who are just like, oh man, man, just call them and say, listen, just cancel. Thursday, be here. Today is Thursday. I'm even losing track. <laughs> <laughs> okay, Friday, <laughs> Friday, Saturday. Be here. Like you get into God's presence at the point, you're like, what day is it? Yeah. Amen. 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 Wow. Thank you guys for building me up. I'm hearing these testimonies. My my own faith is just being built up. I'm like, thank you, Jesus. I honor you, Pastor Milton. Thank you for releasing God's gift on us. Yeah, thank you. Thank you. I honor you. I honor you, Pastor James. Thank you for just being, to ushering us into God's presence. I honor you so much for that. I honor Pastor Trevor. Thank you for listening to the Holy Spirit and just being obedient when he speaks. Uh, you have a boldness, and I love that. And my prayer is that all of us will have a boldness. Amen. When the Holy Spirit gives you a word, don't say, oh, Pastor M, come up and tell Pastor M, I have a word. <laughs> yeah, you are a leader. Step up and just, if the Lord is putting it in your heart, step up and do it. Uh, this is what God is saying. By the way, there are some of you right now who, you don't know where your meals are coming from after this. Uh, you're, you're in a place here, you're rejoicing in God, but lunch, dinner, and there's some prayers that are not supposed to be prayed. They're just supposed to be done. 
The book of Acts just says, you know, they had no poor among them. When people had needs, they just blessed. So I don't want to embarrass you, but I'm going to ask you to just stand if this is you. You're here, but really you're doing so badly, you don't even know where food is coming from uh, for, the, for your children. Just stand. Stand, stand, stand. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah. Bless God. Wow. Wow. Okay. Okay. There's quite a few of us. Um, here's what I'm going to ask you to do, church. Um, just walk up to one of these guys and just get their phone number and bless them with something. Let's just do it. Just, just walk up, whatever the Holy Spirit, even if it's just 100 shillings, whatever you have, if you have it in your, in your cash, just as the Holy Spirit is leading you, already some of you are already seeing it. I can already see some of you walking. Just walk. This is what the church of Jesus is meant to be, that there are no needs among us, that we bless each other. This is how God looks after us and how we look after each other. Just, just walk as the Holy Spirit puts it in your heart. Um, no, let them stay. Yeah. Yeah. Just go. Just walk. As the Holy Spirit led, I'm, I'm allowing the Holy Spirit to be the one to decide who gets what in this one because the Holy Spirit knows what house needs what. So just look around, open your eyes. Come on. Some of you, yes, you may not, you may not be rich, but you know where your food is coming from th- for the next month. Seriously. Just walk up to that person and say, I, I bless you. Yeah, I bless you. Here's something small. The Bible says it's far better to give than to receive, isn't it? There's a blessing for the giver. So just go up right now. Your sister, your brother is in a difficult space right now. Uh, They don't know where their next meals are coming from. But (laughs) you are God's hands. You know, God taught me there's some prayers you pray and others you just answer. (laughs) Revival doesn't just come with the Holy Spirit breaking out. He also comes with God's people being generous. And that's what we see in the book of Acts, chapter 2, verse 42 to 49. Bless the Lord. Bless God, bless God, bless God. Wow, 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 wow. Amen. I love this church. I love this church. Can you see that? Can you see it? This is what it means to be church. Amen. Yeah. Let's love each other. In our campuses, when we notice people are struggling, let's stand up together. Seriously. What is small for you is big for somebody. You might say, my goodness, I only have 200 shillings. But for that person, that's, that's like... <laughs> They walked here because they couldn't cut a matatu. They couldn't even afford that 200 shillings. So let's just bless, bless, bless. There's no shame in God's house. Uh, Some of you may not have money, but listen, some of you should be able to say, silver and gold have none, but I'm speaking a prayer over you right now. Such as I have, I give to you in the name of Jesus. Receive. Come on. This is a time of boldness. Yeah. You don't have to be rich. (laughs) Sometimes you give when you don't have. That's what Peter and John teach us. Yeah. Sometimes it's a hug. I just want to hug you and tell you God is with you. Come on, somebody. Yeah, I love it. Amen. Wow. This is when you say there's a sweet anointing in the sanctuary. Yeah, the Spirit of God is here. The Spirit of God is here. Amen. 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 Anointing in... The sanctuary, there is a stillness in the atmosphere. Come and lay down the burdens you have carried, for in the sanctuary, God is here. The mission God gave us is still as relevant and as urgent today as it has ever been. The mission of turning ordinary people into fearless influencers of society. That doesn't change. That doesn't change. That's who God called us to be. That's our unique identifier as a family. That's who we are called to be. And the reason is because this thing talks about three passions. A passion for the lost. It talks about the fact that we need to reach people where they are. And reach them with grace. Go to them where they are and bring them into God's house. Help them understand who God has called them to be. That has not changed. If ever there was a time when people needed, when lost people needed to find God, this is it. If there's ever a time when our relatives who are lost needed to know God, this is it. So that has not changed. And I want to say in any Mavuno church you go into, this needs to be one of our foci. I mean, I've been talking, whenever I visit the Mavuno church, Pastor James can tell you, I've talked to him about it. And I said, hey, your service, I, I love the fact that your, your service has the presence of God and all that, but don't get spooky. Leave spookiness for the gathering. 
let's always understand. Even Paul talks about the, the place of tongues, and he says when, when there is a gathering of, with, with visitors, then you do tongues with interpretation. He's the one who says that. He says, listen, there has to be order in the house of God. Now, when we're having worship night and when we're having the gathering, let's just go crazy. Come on, somebody. Yeah. yeah. Let's talk all the jargon we want to because it's in the house. There's language for family and there's language for outsiders. Yeah? You know that, don't you? When you're home, there's another name your mother calls you when you're not with your friends. And when you hear that name, you even chill because there's a way she says it. Yeah, yeah, I can see some of you getting the jitters right now. And when, the, when, when she's there, I mean, you, 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 there's a language you speak that I would never understand if I was in the house. But the minute a visitor comes in, the family starts speaking a different language because they want to include. They don't want to exclude. And so this is one of the things that, we, that hasn't changed about us, that we must always be thinking others first. The Son of Man came to seek and save the lost. He left the 99 and he went for the one. And that's what we'll always be about. We are the apostles to the Gentiles. That's what God called us when we started this church. Uh, there are many, many churches that will be reaching the Jews. They'll be gathering the Christians and blessing them. And we thank God for the Christians and we bless them. But for us, we bless so that we can be a blessing. Uh, we, 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 we are here so that we can reach the world. Uh, the second passion he talks about is a passion for transformation, uh, for discipleship. I actually feel that that's what this thing is about. It's like God is saying, okay, I love that you guys love discipleship. Now, let me take you deeper in understanding what discipleship is. So that's kind of what we're, this is what this transformation is about. It's not about changing. It's about let me take you deeper. Somebody say we're going deeper. That's, that's really what this is about. And so God wants us not just to accept people as they are because he loves them as they are, but he loves them too much to leave them that way. So he wants to, hey, he's like, come in, come in the way you are, come in with your drug addiction, come in with your, your micro mini card, come in with your, 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 your big whatever it is, come in with, you. just come in, we won't judge you. We won't judge you, we're not that church that will judge you. But, but change, you change. I remember seeing one guy who came to our church and he, he came with somebody he came with somebody who wasn't his wife. And people ask me, why are you preaching? And that guy is sitting next to somebody who's not his wife. It's like he's brought his clande. In Kenya, we say clande, uh, which is short for clandestine. Uh, he brought, he's brought his clande to church. Why aren't you rebuking him? I said, is he a believer? No. Is he a member of this church? No. So what business do I have to do to rebuke him? That's not my business. If he was one of my leaders, trust me, I'd be in his face. But he's calm as he is. When the Holy Spirit comes, he will even come and kneel over here and tell me, what do I do with her? Because he's not my wife. <laughs> That's the Holy Spirit's business. My job is to preach the Word of God and preach it faithfully and let God transform. Amen? But we understand through discipleship, we're saying we have an agenda for you. When you walk into this church, we see you as an ordinary person, but we see what you could be. And we call out what you could be. That's what discipleship is. And I'm so excited about the discipleship groups because I feel like that's going to shift a lot of things. I'm going to talk about that in a second. The last thing is a passion for societal change. A passion for societal change. Helping God's people become influencers in every sector of society, what some people have called the seven mountains. You guys have heard that language, or the seven spheres. Uh, we talk about six sectors of society, and it's the, same, it's the same concept. It comes from the same sources, and it comes from the scripture, where uh, Genesis chapter 1, verse 28, it says, rule, <laughs> have dominion. This is what human beings are meant to be, and so as Mavuno, we understand that the great commission is a recovery of the original commission. The original commission is about ruling. And when Jesus comes, he comes to restore the keys. He comes to give us back the rule over God's planet. And so we want to help our people grow to the place where they can rule in business. They can rule in politics. They can rule in health. Because that's where they are most of the time. They're not in church most of the time. And we want to take God's kingdom wherever they are. We want your office to be in a place where people walk into your office and they're like, they have the same experience as they would in church. You're discussing tenders and somebody just breaks down and cries and says, just pray for me. Because the Holy Spirit is so rich in your office. Amen. Yeah, that's what we're talking about. We don't want a division between Sunday and the rest of the week. We're saying Sunday to, sun, to Saturday, we are fearless influencers, and we train our people to be that. So this church, those things will not change. Our mission remains the same. Number two, our vision is a multiplying movement of churches. Uh, is it on the screen? Uh, I don't know if you guys are putting it up there. It's a multiplying movement of churches found in every capital city of Africa and the gateway cities of the world by 2035. Now, that's, that's really what our vision is. It still remains the same. It's definitely a vision that requires God's power. Because, <laughs> I mean, we're, we're asking God for big things. But, you know, if you have a vision that's so small, uh, then it's not God's vision. 
If your vision, Pastor Oscar, my, my mentor, used to say, my spiritual father used to say, what are you praying for that will make God sweat? Like, because God is saying, ask me. <laughs> and many times our prayers are so small. So God wants us to ask him for the nations. And this really is reflecting our understanding that the church is the hope of the world. That's what that vision is. That if we want to see society change, then the best thing we can do, the best way to catalyze reformation is by church planting. Because when churches are planted, churches become the factories to mint fearless influences. Churches are the center of discipleship. Churches are the center of prayer and miracles and signs and wonders. And when those things are happening and people are being transformed, then the society will transform. And we've tricked a few things there. If you notice, just put up the sentence again. You're going to notice, oh, it's still up there. Uh, we used to say to plant a culture-defining church. Remember, that's how it used to start. So we've changed how it starts. And the reason is because we, come, we came to realize we're not just planting independent churches. We're not just planting little churches that burn out there. We're planting a family of united churches, churches that are working together towards one common vision. So none of the churches existing here exist by itself. All of us are interdependent. We need one another. We are working together because we have one mission. Uh, we are God's church together. So, so that's, that's, those things haven't changed. So like I said, the one thing that God is teaching us is how to get discipleship and to move this discipleship strategy a lot deeper. So I want to talk a bit about uh, that. And I'm going to first, we've been talking a lot about discipleship groups as a very core part of what we're becoming. That's the, the biggest shift probably that has happened in Mavuno since last year. We had life groups. Now we have discipleship groups. So what's the difference between a life group and a discipleship group? That's actually what I want to talk about. Have you wondered, what's the difference? Some of you have been in life groups for years. What's the difference between a life group and a discipleship group? And I want to just uh, mention some of those. If, the, if you can put up, okay, my goodness, that chat. I'm the one who made it. I, so, I'm sorry. <laughs> I used to know how to make PowerPoints when I was younger. So, so let me read them for you, and maybe we can send this out at some point. We can send out that PowerPoint to everybody. Um, but I'll just go through them one by one. The first difference is that a, discipleship, a life group is led by a facilitator. A discipleship group is led by a discipler. So a facilitator, what's a facilitator? Somebody who convenes people together so they can have a spiritual conversation. It's, it's, bring, come together, let's have a conversation. It might be about the sermon, but it's a, it's a spiritual conversation. A discipler is different because a discipler is a spiritual parent who is determined to see his or her spiritual children grow different, different. Because the, the one is like, we're just facilitating a conversation, and hopefully you guys will grow. The other is like, these are my children. And you know when you have children, they grow or they grow. <laughs> Let me tell you, when I pray for my kids, I don't pray prayers of, oh God, please. I'm like, Lord, I command. <laughs> these ones have to change or they have to change. Their problems are my problems. I love them too much to let them just choose to die. You understand what I'm talking about? Some of, some of you are, are parents of teens, so you know what I'm talking about. You've prayed those prayers. Uh, you've had those conversations. Uh, that's a very big difference. And what we're saying is, if you are a discipleship group leader, you're not just a facilitator, you're a parent. Uh, all the things we're talking about following and parenting, they're not for Pastor M, they're for you. That you will actually be a parent to those you're leading. That means if you find a problem in their marriage, it's your problem. Oh, I'm not hearing any amens in the house today. Yeah, 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 yeah. If there's a problem, some people are arguing and you can see they're talking at each other rudely. That's your problem now. You have to figure out what does this mean because that's a discipleship issue. If you notice that they're always broke and they're always taking loans and the Holy Spirit has told this church we're out of debt, that's your problem. It's you to actually say, guys, let's have lunch because I can see something here that I'm, I need to ask you hard, some hard questions about. And hopefully you're bringing up, you're building a relationship with people of love that they will listen to you because they understand you're their leader. So, so that's it's a difference, a major, major difference, and that's why I put that one first. Uh, life groups meet any day or time of the week. Discipleship groups meet as much as possible on Wednesday evening. Now, I say as much as possible because we don't want to create a rule. It's not in Scripture that the disciples met on Wednesday evening, so we don't want to make rules that are not Scriptural rules. But we're saying, because we're trying to be a united family of churches, that it helps us and gives us momentum when we meet the same day. Now, if your group has people who are doing surgery on Wednesday night and other people, you can actually figure out, maybe us guys meet on Thursday morning or we meet Thursday. You can do that. But what we're saying is as much as possible, as much as possible, we want to meet at the same time. And that means we're trying to reconfigure our schedule so that we're meeting together for, disciple, uh, for, for family night and afterwards we're, we're having our group times. 
Um, so that's, that's the other thing. And, and, and as much as possible, we've made, we've, we've made all our groups geographical. The reason we're making them that way is that we're saying we're all driving to the same place. So it gets easier to even meet uh, physically. Um, the, the world is being robbed of relationships. I don't know if you know that. And it's not going to get better. Uh, right now, COVID has made relationships virtual and lowered the quality of relationships significantly. It has, it's destroying community. And so we're getting used to Zoom meetings as opposed to meeting. And the problem with that is then you don't actually, there's so much, Zoom is a very two-dimensional relationship. There's so much you don't see. When I come and meet in your house, I see a lot. We talk and I see so many things. I see the expressions. I see how you talk to each other. There's so much I see that I don't see when we're on Zoom. So as much as possible, I want my children to meet in my house because I want to know. I want to know what's happening. I mean, you can, the, the exec team will tell you I, I, I bother them because I'm like, we have to meet physically. <laughs> We've been meeting physically a lot. It's because it's like, I need to know what's happening. There's just something that is robbed from that. Now, Facebook have something they call this metaverse, and now they're trying to make it 3D. So you're not, you don't work on, uh, with the internet, you're in the internet. What they're going to do is give you 3D glasses so you enter into even more virtual reality. So I'm here with Trevor. He's in Malawi, but we're having a conversation like this. He's avatar to my avatar. Let me tell you guys, relationships are about to be destroyed greatly. Yes. The devil does not want us to have relationships. You need to understand that he will use technology of this world to destroy the fabric of the thing that holds the church together. When you understand that the world is basically the kingdom of darkness fighting back against the kingdom of light, even some of the so-called technologies you see, you will start to treat them very differently. Because you'll understand some of these are here to destroy families. They're here to destroy relationships. When you see young people today and they can't even talk in a room, they sit with their phones and they're typing. Um, and they don't even know how to talk. Like, they'd rather even talk. I'm sitting next to you on a table, but I'd rather talk to you through Insta uh, and your story and, and, and Snapchat. And then you're sitting there. They're all sitting on the room, your nieces and nephews, and then all of a sudden they all laugh. Ha! <laughs> then you realize they're actually talking with each other. <laughs> but they've lost their ability to relate. That's the devil destroying relationships. So how do we then as discipleship group leaders say, no, 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 guys, as much as possible, let's meet in my house. Let's meet in a house. Even if it means that one night we're sleeping late, let's do it. So, so that's an, an, a major difference. Another one is life groups discuss sermons where time allows. And that means they didn't always discuss sermons, but that was a recommend, recommendation. Uh, for discipleship groups, they discuss and apply the instructions from family night. So they see that as not just a nice conversation to have. They see instruction, and they take that as instruction, and they discuss it. So the disciple is saying, what are we going to do, guys? Because this is God's word for us. So that's a major, major difference. A major, major difference. Um, it's funny, because I was talking to a friend of mine who we've known each other for a long time. He comes from a church that has been a partner church for Mavuno. And, um, and he said, I hear, I've been hearing this conversation about discipleship groups and and, and all this stuff, and spiritual parenting. And he says, I've really had uncomfortable feelings about it. And I said, why? He says, it sounds like you're going to become very directive to your people. You're going to be telling your people what to do. And I said, you know what? Let's talk about your church. And they're having a free the future type thing in their church right now. And I said, because he's on staff in that church, I said, tell me, because I know his pastor. His pastor is a bit like me. He's a bit of a toughy. And so I said, what did the pastor tell the staff about contributing to this? And he said, yeah, we were told that if we don't, if we as staff who are paid are not giving our, our, our sacrificial gift, we should also give our resignation letter. We can't be on staff without a resignation letter. <laughs> well, I asked because I know that's me. That's how I used to be. And so I said, guess what, guys? He's like me, except I have a family. So I'm still a leader and a strong leader but I'm doing it with my family. I said, I used to do it where it was just orders to people who worked for me. And I said, it's not about a strong leader or a weak leader. It's about leading in the context of family. When I'm with my children, I'm still directive, but they love me because they trust my heart. Are you getting what I'm saying? Yeah. And I said, this is, the, so as a discipler, it's not that you're becoming a boss. It's that you're becoming a person who cares too much to let people walk out. How many of our life groups have members who, are, who, who drink and, and they, they did Mizizi, God saved, they're so passionate, they were passionate for God, but you can see right now you're sitting in a complacent group of people. 
Five years ago, they were passionate for God. They wanted to do missions. Today, they just want to come and sit and talk about their issues. Why would you rejoice in that as a life group leader? We're saying as a discipler, that would break your heart. And you'd say, I'd rather break this group apart. I don't want to have a group of complacent Christians who are saying we're going to be life friends. Life friends where? There's a heaven coming for us to be life friends. People are dying on our watch. Yeah, we can't just sit in the house and just have snacks and talk about makeup and what other people... <laughs> And so you, who did what on social media? Seriously. So, so that's the difference. You're a parent. You're, you're directive in that way. And that's a good thing. I don't think it's a bad thing. If a parent saw his children just going astray and sat down and was nice, that parent deserves to go to hell. It's, it's true. Because you're, you're, you're ruining. The Bible says when you don't discipline your children, you're killing them. You're participating in their death. The focus in life groups is on forming friends who will support me through life. It's an invitation space. I'm forming friendships that will support me through life. That's invitation. The focus in discipleship groups is forming a missional family where together we bring at least one person to Jesus every week and we serve our community every month. It's invitation and challenge. I said about Jesus. Jesus did not just say, he didn't just call them to be with him. Oh, guys, I love you. Let's sit and just talk. That was, that's what Peter was looking for. It's like, let's just build some tabernacles and just sit and stare at each other's eyes. Jesus says he called them to be with him and that he might send them out to preach. So when your people are coming to you in your discipleship group, you are called, they're coming to for you to love them. Yes, you want to build family. That's a priority. But you also know, Jesus says, come follow me and I will make you. There's something that's going to happen with you as you follow me. Because I'm growing as a leader, you will also have to grow as leaders. Does that make sense? And some of us, maybe we're uncomfortable with this. We're, we're, we're uncomfortable being leaders. But here's what I'm saying. You cannot be a follower of Jesus if you're not going to be a discipler. That's, that's, that's just it. So for us, what we're saying in discipleship groups, when people come to you, your job is to multiply yourself through them. As I am leading my group, all of you will lead your own groups. Hallelujah. <laughs> so follow me as I follow Jesus. It's a very different proposition. Now, in life groups, I think that I, uh, in life groups, there's no expectation of growth except attending church and attending a life group meeting. So if guys came to life group and they were in church on Sunday and they came for the life group meeting, as a leader, you're like, yeah, yeah, yeah. They're doing what they're meant to be doing. Discipleship group is different because every member is expected to grow. And as a discipleship group leader, it's my job to make sure my members are there for 4.30 prayer. I mean, how do you be a Christian and you don't know how to pray for an hour? Seriously. I love how Bishop Doug says the least, the minimum time a Christian can pray is an hour. I used to wonder, where did he get this from? What scripture is this? Then I saw Jesus saying, will you not at least watch one hour? <laughs> at least one. Like for the disciple. If you're a disciple, one hour. And he didn't say one hour is for disciples. He said at least. <laughs> at least one hour. How many of you can testify, before we started for 30, I could not pray even for 10 minutes. Like continuously. Yeah. I didn't even know how to string sentences together. How many of you can testify that because of 4.30, I'm even amazed how long I'm praying? Amen. Come, come on, somebody. Amen. Amen. Yeah, that's discipleship. Imagine if we just continued how we were. People would still be here saying prayers for two minutes. Then they're expecting their children to pray. If you pray for two minutes, your child will pray for half a minute. Yeah, it's just the reality. That means we're bringing up a generation of mediocrity. Yeah, your own children in your house won't learn how to pray. But now you can pray for an hour. Your children at least will pray for 45. Amen. <laughs> and because that's just, and you, because you know the minimum for them is an hour, you will pray for longer because you want them to pray an hour. Amen. Somebody? Amen. Amen. Uh, groups in life groups, life groups are mostly closed, occasionally taking in new members to maintain their number. So life groups, a leader will come and tell you, uh, I lost three members. Could you give me three members? Because I feel like we need a bit of, we need, it's like for the sake of the group. Uh, but other times you'll actually say, oh, we have people. And Pastor James, I don't know, Pastor Milton, you can attest. A life group leader will tell you, our group is full. We don't need more members. That's, that's a life group. A discipleship group, groups are open, actively inviting people to join them and become part of the family. If you're a, disciple, a discipleship leader, you're saying invite your friends, invite your neighbors, invite your relatives. This group is open. This is life. Why are we keeping life to ourselves? Let them come and join our DG meeting. And you rejoice as your group is growing. Yeah. And people are coming to Christ. Amen. When you do evangelism, people get saved. You tell them we have, we have fellowship. Come and join our group. And the group always has an extra chair. Because they're always looking for people to join. Life groups, 
Groups stay together through, through relationships, perhaps exchanging leadership when the previous one needs a break, or maybe they even have a rotation. Like this year, so-and-so is leading. Am I talking to people who know about our life groups in this church? Yeah, yeah. this year it's so-and-so, next year it's so-and-so, and they kind of exchange leaders on rotation, or maybe the leader burns out and it's like, I'm tired, who's going to take over? The next person takes over. Uh, so the, the groups are held by relationship. In discipleship groups, groups stay together through relationship and mission. So it's not that relationship is not important. It's just half of what's important. It's like relationship and mission. So each group member is being equipped to lead their own group. So it's like, imagine a parent who has some beautiful, beautiful daughters and handsome sons and just tells them, guys, let's just be together for." for I mean, what's that? Can't, can't we hear your parents? And can't we supply you all your needs? Let's just stay together. We love each other. We grow old together. We hang together for life. That's a life group. And that's messed up. If you walked into that family, you'd say, this is a dysfunctional family. There's some serious issues with this family. Be like, you daughters don't want to see men because your father is there. That is dysfunctional. There are some things your father cannot do for you. Am I talking to somebody here? Yeah. There are some things you have to move out of your father's house. But if you go to a family where they love each other, they're fun, they enjoy each other, but the father is always like, I'm praying for the spouses for these kids, guys. I'm praying for homes for them. I'm praying for great careers so they can step out and start their own entities. That's a healthy family. And that's a discipleship group because you're saying, guys, every one of you is going to start your own family. Does that stop us being a family? No, it doesn't. In, in fact, it strengthens our family. There's no greater joy for my parents than when I come with, with Pastor Carol and our kids and my brother Mutahi comes with Rosalind and their kids and, and my sister Wairimo comes with, with Richard and their kids and we have a family get together. Oh my God, my parents are proud. They're like, this is family. This is family. If it was just the three of us in the house, <laughs> they'd be like, you guys, man, we're great. it's getting old. The jokes are old. But now... Carol comes in with her, and she's amazing. She has a different way of seeing things. She has her gift of healing, so she's laying hands on people. My people are not used to that. And, and she's talking about hubs, uh, Pastor Carol and her hubs. <laughs> By the way, let me just say this. Let me say this. Pastor Carol used to pray for a gift of healing. She, I really believe that if, like, she, she would have become a doctor because she's passionate about healing. And she actually does have a gift of healing. But God has given her a very peculiar gift of getting hubs. And I tell you, anybody who had COVID who came to a house got healed through her hubs. Uh, do I have some people in the house who can testify? Yes, they are here. By the way, she actually, and God just gives her wisdom. She's just able to combine, like if, if I used to, I tell her if it was back in the day, she would be a medicine woman. You know those? <laughs> she just has a gift of understanding this hub goes with this hub goes with this hub. So she brings that into my family. And now my mom is so excited about hubs because her extra daughter came in with extra gifts. You understand? And then, and then, and then uh, Rosalind, uh, my brother's wife, loves agriculture and she loves farming. So now she's farming on their farm. And it's like she's brought something. None of us would have done that. I, trust me, that farm would still be like that. And then, and then Richard, who is that computer geek who's married my sister. And he comes and he's hooked up their house. They now have CCTV and they have Wi-Fi. And whenever he comes, their house just gets an upgrade. It's like if we were left, the, rest, the two of us would be calling them still. Now, in fact, my dad tells me, let me just hold on. I just want to check my app to see how my house is doing. Yeah. <laughs> it's true. Thanks to his son-in-law. Are you beginning to understand the difference? Yeah. So even though the life group looks like such a fun place to be, it is a stifling place to be. The discipleship group is life and its future and its legacy. That's the difference. Uh, in life groups, the groups are mostly disconnected from other groups in the church. It's like they do their thing. They are, they are their own family. But in discipleship groups, groups are interconnected. You know, as numbers increase, the group multiplies. Because what's going to happen as you're inviting neighbors? We're going to get too many, yeah? And then I'm going to tell Pastor Milton, Pastor Milton, now that your children, are beca you've, you've brought so many of your relatives into our group. There's no space. Can we use your house? And have, can you guys start meeting in your house? Do you know what has happened? We've become an extended family. And once a month, when we go to reach the poor, because we were reaching the poor already as our group, once a month we are serving the community, once a month we will still go with our relatives. So the family has just expanded. There's a big difference. And it's actually joy that has expanded. Because when we meet once a month, we're celebrating how many we've become. Like when I see my dad, when we go for those family holidays and all the grandchildren are, are around, you should see his pride. 
He's like, this is life. You know, he's seeing his nieces and nephews and their grandchildren. They even have great grand. You're like, wow, this is life. And that's what it is. is as, as a group leader now, you have, you're seeing your children's children. You're seeing your group's groups. <laughs> it's growth in the kingdom, isn't it? That's actually fruitfulness. Because the Bible says that we're supposed to multiply, be fruitful, multiply, and fill the earth. A life group is not fruitful because you stay together. But a, a discipleship group, you're seeing your fruit. You're seeing the increase. You're thinking, if I didn't reach these people and disciple them, all these 10 groups would now not exist. Wow! Come on, somebody. Yeah, this is it. Every one of us is called to be a patriarch and a matriarch. <laughs> yeah, you're a grandfather. You'll be looking at your children and saying, these are my spiritual children's children. Some of you, are, this is stretching your imagination a lot. <laughs> it's a lot to take in. <laughs> but this is what it is, and it's going to happen. Uh, in uh, the last two, in a life group, alignment to the vision is through periodic training of group leaders. So what would happen is the groups would do their thing, and then eventually the pastor calls them together. Am I talking to some pastors here? And you're like, guys, this is it. This is the vision. Then they go and do their thing again. But in discipleship groups, alignment to the vision is through everyone in the groups being connected weekly to the voice of their shepherd. That's what family night is. So you're saying it's not leaders we're equipping. We're equipping everybody because everybody is a leader. Isn't that amazing? It's like all your group members, you're seeing their potential, so you're, you're equipping them. And you're saying the conversations we're having for leaders, they're, they're for you as well. And so every week, we have family night, and we're connecting every group in Mavuno Church to one conversation. But then at fourth, during the daily prayer, they're connecting to the voice of their campus pastor as well. And so we are saying that it's not just a group in independence, in, in hiding somewhere. Every one of our groups is hearing the same language. And that's another powerful thing. And then the last one is in a life group, new leaders are commissioned and promoted through availability and appointment. So basically, Pastor Kilonzi looks around and is like, this guy is always here in church on time. Would you like to lead a group? Would you like to be my zonal leader? I mean, because he's like, you're so available. And yeah, let me just appoint you. And he calls out and appoints his people. He's faithful. He's been doing cables nicely. He's always here on time for prayer. This guy looks like he'd be a good leader. In discipleship groups, new leaders are commissioned and promoted through multiplication and fruitfulness. So what makes you get become a missional community leader? A missional community leader oversees several discipleship groups because your group multiplied. You, you become a grandfather because your children had children. Before, we used to appoint you to be a grandfather. <laughs> it's like, Zuse, man, you're so good at folding cables and you come for prayer. You're a grandfather today. It's like, that is not how it's supposed to be. Now, I'm not, by the way, some of this stuff, I'm laughing at myself. Because it's stuff, I mean, this is what I knew. And I don't think it was a mistake. I think sometimes God allows you to go through a journey. So you discuss, when you get to where you're going, you really understand it. I even feel like, unfortunately, there's so many churches that do what we were doing that God is helping us discover it, not just for ourselves, but for the sake of the world. Uh, I really am convinced that there's some things that we're going through right now that are going to be a blessing to much of the church as we discover them. So, so that's how, that's the difference. So if you've ever wondered about the difference, we're going to send you that slide. And if you're having a conversation with your life group, former life group, you're able to tell them, this is a difference. This is what we're talking about. Is that helpful for somebody? Yeah, yeah, because now it's like, yeah, 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 I get it. Because we're asking life group change into, but we don't know what the difference is. This is the main, these are the main differences. Now, let's talk about how discipleship groups multiply, uh, the birth of a discipleship group. And I'm going to ask them to put up a slide on that. Again, the, the, the writing might be small, but I'm going to send it out to you. Um, although Pastor Milton prayed for our eyes to be healed. Uh, <laughs> now you need to pray for telescopic vision. <laughs> so, so, step one in your group multiplying is prayer. Prayer is where it rises and falls on. Uh, you have to want to see people grow. You have to want to see people come into Christ. So as a discipleship group leader, and by the way, right now, discipleship group leader means all of us. Huh? So don't think this is somebody else, because if you're not leading a group now, you will be leading one in the very near future. Um, for you as a group leader, you should want to see your people grow. You should want to see people come into Christ. That's what we're here for. Remember, we talked about that yesterday. And so, so for you, it starts with prayer. Lord, open their eyes. If it's the people outside the, the group, their, their friends, their relatives, it's like uh, the friends and the relatives of the people in your group, it's like, Lord, open their eyes for salvation. If it's the people in your group, Lord, open their eyes so that they understand who they are called to be. So it always starts with prayer. And then the next thing is evangelism. We talked about evangelism yesterday. God is calling all of us to be evangelists. Now, 
evangelism happens, it's a scary word for some people. I think yesterday I gave you the scriptural reasons why we must all be passionate about evangelism. And we talked about those Greek words. Anybody remember what they were? Anakazo, which means? Compel. And then? Biazo, which means? Be forceful, be violent. And then the last one was? Anadea, which means? Be shameless, shameless, shameless audacity. So, so this, is, this is what God is calling us to be. But there are very simple ways. I talked about prayer evangelism. Prayer evangelism is just asking people, how can I pray for you? And as you pray, and as people receive the gift of prayer, then it's very easy then to tie in the gift of, have you, by the way, even as I pray for you, or just before I pray for you, or now that I've just prayed for you, have you ever made the decision to ask Jesus into your life as your Lord and Savior? And it's like, no. Is there any particular reason why? Um, well, you know what? If you ask God into your life, I can tell you, even the prayers I'm praying for you, you have the authority to pray for them. The Bible says if you become a child, you get the right to become a child of God when you ask Him. And would you be okay with me praying for you to ask God into your life? Boldness. A little compelling there. A little biazo there. And surprising many times. Like I said, every time I ask people and they say yes, I'm always like, uh, are you sure? Because I'm, I'm ready, I've readied myself for rejection. It's like, yeah, they're probably going to... Jesus said, some of them will say no. Out of the, the, the seed that was sowed, only 25% of it gave fruit. So I always come with 25% might say yes. 75% will probably say no. So when you're one of the 25, I'm like, yes, Jesus, that is so awesome. And I pray for you. Uh, another way to do evangelism is through invitation, inviting people into your discipleship group. That's another simple way. It's like, by the way, do you guys have unchurched friends, unchurched neighbors? Tell them we have fellowship. Invite them into our group. And it's another way of just getting people enfolded into the community. And while you're in there, again, for you as a discipleship leader, you're praying. And that maybe as you pray, as you have a great discipleship group meeting and people are bonding, it's like to ask somebody, by the way, have you ever, be, have you ever given your life to Jesus? Have you ever asked Jesus into your life? Biazo. Come on, guys. That's what God is calling us to. So you do evangelism, but then here is the step. I didn't talk about it yesterday because I wanted to explain it technically in this way. When you meet somebody, Pastor James, and you invite you, they give their lives to Jesus, or when somebody visits your group and has come for the first time with somebody, or uh, maybe somebody comes to church and uh, accepts an altar call and we get their name, uh, somebody who accepts an altar call, this gift of visitation is a powerful gift. And that's when you say, hey, can, uh, when are you home this week? I'd love to visit. Where do you live, first of all? And, oh, wow, that's awesome. Like, I live not too far from there. When are you home? I'd love to visit you and come and just pray for you at home. Uh, or where do you work if home is too far? That's awesome. <laughs> I'm usually in town uh, towards the end of the week. Is there a good time I can come even over lunch and just pray for you? Just going into their space. What that does, it just, ans let me tell you what happens. You dignify people. And I realized this. When the missionaries came first, the British missionaries were here, one of the things they did is they made us a receiving culture. Yeah? Africans are a receiving culture. I'm sure it's the same way in Malawi. We're used to people from the outside coming and bringing us things. So the missionary said, oh, these poor people, they don't have anything. Let's build the church for them. Oh, these poor people, they don't have hymn books. Let's buy hymn books for them. Oh, these poor people, they don't even have shoes. Let's bring shoes for them. And even today, we're still seeing it happening in missions. It's like they don't have water. Let's drill a borehole for them. They don't have, it's like, let's give them. So guess what happens to people on the field? They're left feeling our gifts are inadequate. The things God gave us are not good enough for the mission. So, so, so we end up becoming recipients. A hundred years of church history and people are still waiting for Westerners to come and bring the gospel to them and to take the mission, take missions to uh, Mombasa, to where the Muslims are, and to Middle East. And yet we're here. So how do we do it differently? I wish that person had said, what gifts do you already have? Um, you know what happens? When I'm going to your house, I'm saying, you host me. And guess what happens? I told you about the lady who made a meal for us. It's like we dignified her because it's like, my goodness, I'm hosting them. I'm, I gave her responsibility over us. I gave her an opportunity to be hospitable to us. There's just something that happens when it's like I'm asking, when you ask someone for help, by the way, you give them power. You empower them. They feel dignified. And no wonder then at the end they were like, our house can be used for discipleship group. Yeah, because they have dignity. They realize, yeah, we can host pastors in our house. We can host our neighbors, <laughs> you know. So going into their space is, I didn't even know this. When, pastor, when Apostle Mo first taught it, I really had to take time to pray about it and ask God, show me why this is so important. And I've come to realize when I go to see someone in the office, 
There's a certain way they feel I know their world. They've shown me their desk. They've explained what their office does. They've shown me who's who and what's up. And then we've prayed, and I've prayed for them in their office. They just feel like we're bonded. And it becomes very easy for me to say the next thing, which is invitation. Uh, and what I do is I say, by the way, I love, thank you so much for hosting me. It's been fun. I've been so, I'm so excited to know where you live. Hey, this every Wednesday, in fact, even two days from now, Wednesday, we actually have fellowship in my house. Uh, we just have a time when we have fellowship, and we, uh, we pray together, a few friends, we listen to God's word, and we also, uh, once a month, we, 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 we reach out to the poor. We help the poor in the community. Why don't you come this Wednesday and meet some of my friends? And again, guess what has happened? My visit has obligated you. Africans are very hospitable. When someone comes and visits you, you feel like you're connected. Yeah, you're, and you are connected. That's the beauty of our culture. And so when I tell you, come, and let's do this. You're no longer a stranger I'm talking to on the street. If I just met you, led you to Christ, and then told you, come and visit my house, you'd be like, ah, this is moving a little fast. <laughs> but when I come to your house, I've dignified your house. Your house may not be all that. It might be tiny. It might be whatever. But I've, I've, I'm in it, and I've eaten your food. And that breaking of bread just connects us. So, hey, come. Come into my house. And so they come, and they fellowship, and they hopefully your life group has fun people, your discipleship group. And they watch uh, maybe family night with you guys, and they discuss it. And it's like, wow, these are really fun people. And then you move to the step of engagement. I'm so glad you came. Hey, do you have any friends or family members or neighbors that we can invite next week? Uh-huh. You're now engaging the person as part of the harvest force from day one. You're turning that person you've just met into an evangelist from day one. And somebody might say, yeah, I've got a roommate. Or I live with my sister. Uh, or I've got, uh, I'm looking after my nephew. So yeah, bring them. Because a discipleship group is not like a life group. Like, uh, the other thing I didn't mention about life group, life groups tend to be homogenous. It's like we're all the same age. We all have the same capacity and the same, we're sort of like all nice middle class people. Here it's like, look, they're younger, just bring them. They'll be our friend. In fact, young people need mentors. <laughs> Let them come out and hang out with us. We want to know them. And so they invite their friends and your group is growing. Growth happens as the next stage. And what happens is, uh, in growth, it's like, I so love that you also join us. By the way, we meet every week. Uh, so please, now this is their friends event. Please come next week, bring other friends. Uh, do you have any friends or family members or neighbors? So the person who came, I'm also asking them the same question. And it's like, everybody who comes turns into an instant evangelist. Can you see why my discipleship group is growing so fast? It's because everybody who comes becomes an evangelist right away. It's not waiting for Pastor Kelonzi to tell me, here, three, people, three, three more people to join your group. It's like my group is filling up. And that's how your group grows. And there's prayer and evangelism and the birth of your discipleship group. It, does that seem simple? It's not, it's not as complex as you make it because everybody has a neighbor. Everybody has a friend. Everybody has a workmate that they, need to, that they can invite. And so use, turning your group into people who are passionate about bringing their friends and consuming the content and being able to just have conversations, real conversations uh, over it. Now... Once you've done this, your group has grown. And the thing about, you want to, you, you, uh, the, the other things to just note about this, um, and by the way, never, never, keep, never stop the prayer and evangelism. Uh, never lose the heat for that. That's always a thing you're telling your group, guys, there are so many people who don't get a chance to have this kind of fellowship. There are so many people who don't have these kinds of friendships. Let's invite our friends. Now, your capacity will be determined by your living room size, isn't it? <laughs> so at some point, you're going to start getting, uh, get outgrowing the space. But we'll come to that in a second. The thing to note is, once a month, we want to challenge all our groups to do community service together. So every group, we want you to find something in your geography. That's why, again, it's so important to have geographical groups. We want you to find something in your community that you're saying it's a children's home, it's an old people's home, it's, a, it's, a, it's a, a public school that just is so dilapidated and needs, needs mentoring and all that. It's as, as creative as you guys will get it because there are needs that are different in every place. It might be just uh, uh, maybe you live in a, in a leafy suburb, but you've realized that the domestic workers in, in this place just need help. Uh, maybe, maybe, I don't know, whatever, the watchmen in the area. There's, there are always needs everywhere. And so it's figuring out what is that thing that we are, we are all going to be going once a month, pick a Saturday a month, and just go and serve. And don't just send money. We want people to actually go and connect with the needs of their community. So that's, that's, that's something that you're challenging. And remember, it's not just relationship. It's relationship and mission. 
So it's being able to say, guys, we can't live selfishly for ourselves. Four weekends for me. The whole, every Saturday is for me. No, let's pick one and give it to the community. And you know what happens? Relationships grow faster when there's mission. That's what people don't realize. When, when, you are, when we are actually doing something on the front line together, something changes in our relationships. We start depending on each other a different way. We have more memories. We have more things that we can talk about. It just grows us. So, so, so that's one of the things. So you can start, you, you can, if, you, if, you have, if you're stuck with ideas, talk to your campus pastor, brainstorm some ideas of things you can do. Uh, another thing to note is you can actually get a volunteer to start a children's discipleship group. I really like this one, by the way. Uh, but some of these ideas, I, I, uh, let me give credit where, where it comes from. I actually sat down with Pastor Sam Chirabo, who's a Worship Harvest pastor, and he just helped me think through some of these things. I, I told him, this is what I'm trying to teach, and he gave me a lot of great ideas about things, because he has a church where they started here, uh, I think we celebrated them last fearless, isn't it? And already there are 350 people. And I'm like, how do you, as Ugandans, just start a church and it grows like that? And, you, and, and, and you, you're, just, you're just growing. And he said, these are, these are our practices. This is what our discipleship groups do. And I thought, this makes so much sense. It's so scriptural, and it's so simple. So one of the things that I learned from them is they have discipleship groups that are children's groups. Now, I want us to pioneer this. In every group, inevitably, there's somebody who's good with children. There'll always be somebody who's just natural with the kids. You'll even see them when, you're, when they come to visit. They just connect with the kids. Are there any people who are just naturally good with the kids in the room? Let me just see. Kids just like you. Yeah, I don't know. By the way, I get mad at that. Eh? We're in a party on uh, last Friday. We went with my wife to, uh, to a party, and somebody from Mavuno downtown, no, Mavuno Life, uh, Lovington, that guy didn't even come to church. He watches on, on, on YouTube. Like, there's a, there are some two kids, they're, they're being like all shy, all shy. So we're like, oh, come and say hi. They're just being all shy. Then the guy walks in, he wears glasses, he's just gangly, he sits. And the girl is like, oh, let me show you my toy. And I'm like, do you know this kid? I've just met her. And all of that, they're bringing, she's bringing her paintings. She's sitting with him and showing him. Then the wife says, even I get annoyed at this guy. Somehow kids are just drawn to him. <laughs> like, there's some of you like that. I get so annoyed. I'm like, seriously, what is it about you? Can't you're good people and us, we are bad people. You know, they say, they say children can sense purity of heart or something. I don't know what it is. I don't know what it is. <laughs> but, but... <laughs> There is always someone in every group who has that. So what you do is tell them, meet our children. Let's agree on a time when our kids, if it could be a Saturday afternoon, uh, it could be a Sunday morning, whatever it is. You meet our kids and have a discipleship group. And the kids could be different ages, so get the older kids to also help out. And just take the Mavuno Kids video. In fact, one of the things I'd like to ask you guys is, we need to get that Mavuno Kids video out early. Uh, have it out by Friday. So, that we can, so people can actually take it, watch it with the kids, and then just do a lesson. It's a beautiful thing. Because uh, guess what happens now is you're starting to form a children's discipleship group. And you're teaching your children discipleship is not for adults. The greatest revival, the longest running revival rather in the world was the East African revival, 50 years. It died because they didn't know how to bring us, their kids, into it. Any Tukutendras are people here know. It's like it became their thing. And that's how you lose the traction. So one of the things we want to do is make sure our kids love Jesus. I pray for my kids to love ministry. Not because I'm a pastor, but because, my goodness, how can you be a Christian and not love ministry? Seriously, what are you here on earth for? You're being trained for ministry for the rest of your life, and you don't do ministry here. So it's like I want them all to love ministry. I don't care what career they pick, but I want them to be passionate about serving God. That's, that's the thing I pray for them. So, I, so, so get all our kids there. So start a kids' discipleship group. If you have somebody who's fantastic with teens and your group is older and you have some teenagers, you can even start a teens' discipleship group with that person. Um, so again, somebody volunteers. The beauty of this is now you spread leadership. You don't have to be the one doing it as a discipleship group leader. Um, if you have, maybe some of you have house helps and you live in the same neighborhood and somebody is really excited about that, you can actually start a Swahili discipleship group as well. And again, this is something that is amazing because we have, we have a movement in Mavuno right now of Swahili churches. Um, and I love that because in, 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 in Kampala, it will be what? Luganda churches. Yeah. In every country we're in, for you guys, it would be Chichewa. So in every country we're in, there's another language group that doesn't speak English and yet needs the gospel. So rather than, than just being this church that we don't have anything to do with them, some of you can actually start that discipleship group. So how did the church, uh, the fastest growing church in Mavuno was <laughs> Mavuno, Mavuno Church Wayakiwe, Swahili. 
And, and it started because these guys just started noticing there were people coming to church who were Swahili speakers. And so they were trying to figure out how to reach them. They were little kids. Um, okay, I know I'm mangling this story. But, but somewhere in that process, Pastor Kelvin called me and said, what do we do? We've got all these people and they don't understand English. And I said to him, talk to Pastor Reverend Cheche. Because we have a Swahili church that's very established here at Mavuno Church that could easily lend you somebody to help start. And that's what he did. And that guy came and organized, and now they have a whole Swahili service running. And that's our second church in, in this movement. I love it. By the way, it was an accident of the Holy Spirit. Even this Swahili church was an accident of the Holy Spirit. But when I got, got to hear about Bishop uh, Doug, they have 10 denominations under Lighthouse Chapel. Like, that's insane. Usually when a guy is a bishop, he has a denomination. The guy has 10 denominations. Why? Because it's like, start the movement. He has a denomination for students only, like college ministry. And it's, a fanta- it's called First Love. It's an amazing church. Then he has Lighthouse Church. He actually left Lighthouse Church to under an archbishop so he could go and help with it. his passion, his students. And then they have a French uh, denomination. And they just have different ones that are meeting different needs, which is fantastic. And all of them are associated. They, they're, a, a, they're a movement of movements. And so I've been challenging all the people with college ministries. We need to start a, a, a movement for college ministries. Yeah, and it's starting. I mean, some of these guys are doing, they're doing fantastic work in different countries. And we want to connect those and just say, this is, it's Mavuno, yes, but it's got a distinct flavor. It's the next generation, and we want to reach them there. So, so yeah, so if we start a Mavuno, if you guys have local language speaking people and somebody in your group is really good at it, form a, a diff- at a different time of the week, just call them, Saturday morning. Everybody release your house help and let's come and just do a thing and let's grow them as well. I mean, I love that. I had a story from Worship Harvest that was so cool. This pastor, when he goes for their, what they call MC Live, which is their family night, um, the lady who's their house help uh, is now a, is a discipleship group leader. Um, as, uh, so she's leading her own discipleship group. And then she met a guy who was, to all extents, I mean, he was, he was in what we'd call in English insane. I mean, he just was, was lost. He, you know how you find a guy? You know the picture in African countries. The guy is so dark because it's not his skin color, it's just the dirt. And then he's walking around in the marketplace. So the guy just came to ask her to talk to her, and she, of course, she kind of freaked out. She was with the pastor's kids. And so the, the guy said, no, no, I don't, want, I don't want money. And she said, what do you want? I want to know Jesus. So she, right there in the market, led him to Jesus. And then, and then she told him, let's go home. You need to take a shower. So she went home with the guy and the two kids. Uh, this is an insane story when you think about it. Huh? She went home with the two kids. The guy put him in her shower. Uh, the guy showered, cleaned up. Then now his rugs, it's like she took them, put them in a basket, kind of threw them off. Now she was like, I don't have male clothes. So she said, I'm sure the pastor never wears this shirt. So she got the pastor's shirt and trousers <laughs> and took to the guy and put on him. And then she, the, she I mean, the guy was sound mind. Like he was talking to her in good English. And then she took him to the living room and she sat him down and she served him supper and they were sitting there having supper when the pastor came back from family night. And it's like, who is this guy? I'll tell you the story later. He's our friend. <laughs> he's, a member of, he's a new member of our discipleship group. <laughs> so it's only after they left that the, and the pastor is looking at that shot like, kind of looks familiar, but... <laughs> what?! My goodness, what happens when you turn your whole family, including your house help, into a mission force? It's the glory of God, isn't it? That's revival. And so this is what, this is what I'm saying. It's like, don't be afraid. Let's be biazo with even our, our, our group members. Hey, I think you're so good in Swahili. You need to lead a discipleship group for our, for our house helps. And we'll all release. We'll agree on the time that's convenient for them and release them. So this, these are some ideas of things you can do. And uh, when the group grows, every, when, as a group meets every month, it soon becomes too big from, for a home. Soon you start meeting in a second home, but you remain their disciple. So the person, because you are discipling them, they're in your group. Now they've started another group. What's happening is they still come, you're still the person who they look up to as their disciple. So they don't report to Pastor Kilonzi. They report to you as a disciple. They're the ones who tell, if there are numbers for them to report, they'll report to you so that you can report to Pastor Kilonzi because they're still under your relationship and under your care. So... Um, like I said, they meet monthly to serve in a front line, and then they, they eventually will become a zone uh, as they grow. So we'll talk a bit about that. Now, let me just say this. It all rises and falls on leadership. This whole thing I've described does not work unless we have strong leadership in this church. We need every one of you to understand that you are a leader. Yeah. 
Here's the flip side of leadership. You understand that the best followers make the best leaders. That's what my mentor taught me, Pastor Oscar. Uh, followership doesn't make you a passive person. It actually makes you an active leader. We talked about it when we said it's not about cloning. It's about helping you become the skilled kingdom entrepreneur, entrepreneurial leader that God created you to be. So every one of us will have to lead well for this to happen. And so let's look at the slide that says the multiplication of a, of a discipleship group uh, because I want to talk a bit about that. So what happens is we can't... The next step is commissioning. Uh, uh, we, we are basically saying we definitely can't fit any more people in our living room. Uh, I'd like you to start meeting together in your living room with these guys that you invited. And we'll still meet once a month as an MC, as a missional community now, uh, to do our frontline ministry because our frontline ministry still needs us. And so we pray for them. We celebrate them. We have cake. We have a party. It's like married. It's like your child has left home. You know, I have teenagers right now. They're about, uh, how old are kids? 17, uh, twins, and then 20. And because I'm a good parent, I'm looking forward to the day they leave my house. I told you, good parents don't cling to their children. That's killing your child. So I, I, I cast vision. By the way, you guys, you're now in college. A time is coming. In fact, it's come already. Start thinking about where you're going to stay. How are you going to make money when you're there? Like, at first, they're so scared. But I'm like, no, no, no. You need to leave the house. You can't stay. In fact, when I was in your age, when I was your age, I was not in my father's house. So even you guys are here on grace. In fact, at some point, you need to start paying rent. And I've told, we built a house. When we built a house, we built small rooms. Because I didn't want them to get too comfortable. You know, when you start building these big houses of yours, these kids will never leave. Because it can't compare with anything they can rent out there. So it's like, um, it's like hey, we, we have a party and celebrate. And say they're ready to start their own group. And we launch them. And we're like, they're our child, you know? So it's a celebration. It's not a death. It's actually a life that has come to pass. And so we launch them. And then after that, guess what happens? What we continue doing? The same things we were doing before. Prayer, evangelism, visitation, invitation, engagement. Same process we took, we went through before. And what's happening? Both life groups, both discipleship groups are growing. So the first one, we had this group multiplied into those two little smaller groups. Now our living room has space. It means we can invite more people. So we start doing the same. They start doing the same. And guess what happens? The groups now start to multiply. And eventually, our, our room is too big. Zuse, it's time for you. The guys you've been bringing, you're the next one. You're ready. Let's have a party for you guys. And as we are launching, we're celebrating this culture of we're, we're here to grow. The fact that you've, we're ready to launch you is just, it's promotion. It's multiplication. It's leadership. You've shown leadership. So it's time for you to go and lead. Uh, in that space. We we'll keep meeting once a month. So it all rises and falls on leadership. Each discipleship group, we're challenging the groups to each bring one person a week to Christ. So if we're, if we're six of us or we're seven of us, it means all of us are sowing the gospel and having conversations. We just need all of us, out of all our conversations, one person comes to Christ. And we're saying that's possible. If all of us are investing in this weekly, it's possible for one person to come to Christ from that group. In fact, that might even be a small number for some groups. Um, and then what happens is uh, the discipleship group leader is to shepherd, the, your, your DG role, uh, leader role, is to shepherd the members of your group and grow them so they're ready to multiply. So that's why discipleship is important. If they're fighting as a couple, they will never lead a group. That's why it's so important for you to just love on them, lovingly point them to help. If, you, if you're not a marriage counselor and you're single and you have a group, a, a couple who are married and you're really out of your depth with this one, is to be able to talk to the husband if you're a man or the wife if you're a woman and say, hey, I really notice things aren't working here. But listen, because I love you guys so much, I want you to meet Pastor Carol. I really need you to meet Pastor Faith. Uh, and I'm ready to organize that meeting because I feel like you really need, it's going to hinder your leadership if you don't solve some of the issues I see with you guys. That's, that's, that's parenting. That's leadership. And you're saying, I love you guys too much to leave you struggling the way you, I see you. Or you're struggling too much financially. Let's have a conversation. I'm even willing to talk about how I manage my finances. If I'm not an expert, I'm willing to look for somebody to come and talk to us as a group on this one. But I feel like I need to help you. Because I realize the way you're in debt, you'll never lead a group well. You'll start borrowing from your members. <laughs> you know? so, 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 so we're, we're leading our people. So the life group leader commissions a member to start in their, in their home. You keep coaching them. You meet monthly at the community service event, and part of your coaching is to envision them to do the same rhythms you did as a group and to grow. Now, somebody asked me, it was so hard to get life groups to multiply those days, because people would always feel, I don't want to leave my friends. 
So how is, why is this going to be different? And what I said is life groups were closed systems. Closed systems don't want to be changed. But if every week a new member is joining your group, guess what happens? People start getting excited about growth. People start getting excited about seeing new people come. The, the mission becomes what holds us together, not just coziness. Like, my goodness, listen to the testimony. This guy was walking and he met them. And this one has now come to Christ and they have a testimony. That's our group that did that. Oh, my God. We're living for something bigger, isn't it? And that's how you, your group starts getting excited about seeing people come to Christ. So that's one, of the, that's one of the reasons I think it will be easier to multiply. Now, four to six discipleship groups, you have what you call a, a, a missional community. I have a missional community. Maybe show the one about the formation of a missional community. Um, the next slide. Okay. So from that, you form all, all, you've, got, you've got all your one group. And then now what happens? You go to this. Just put the slide even on the two uh, side screens, yeah. You get, you get uh, the, the MC leader is the original discipleship group leader. Then the discipleship group leaders are the original members of the group. So now these people are leading groups. And guess what happens? Now you've got four to six, and that's a full missional community. And that missional community, why are they missional? Because they do mission together. They go see the poor together. They have a place that they all serve together. And that's how they work. And then uh, the DG members are, are all leaders in training. They're not, they're, no, they're no members in this thing. Everybody's a leader in training. They're getting ready to start their own groups. So, so, that's, that's, um, so once the missional community has four, 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 to, four, four to six uh, groups, they, they're already thinking about multiplying to a second missional community. Uh, because it's all about growth. When I see you, I want you to grow. Yeah? Pastor James, when I saw you, I was like, I want you to become better than me. I want you to become greater than me. That's my attitude whenever I'm leading people. It's like I need you to actually grow. So I don't want to hoard and become your leader for life. Because what am I making you? I'm making you a follower for life. I want you to actually grow so you're leading your own people. So what's happening is when I'm getting to four to six groups, I'm already having a plan for which of my group leaders looks like they can lead the next, the next mission or community. Because the time is coming, I'm going to give them two of the groups and they will hive off, and he will become their missional leader. And I'll be left with two of my groups. Or maybe I'll even get someone to lead the other two, so I become their, their, their disciple. I become their zonal pastor. So the next level will be a zonal uh, pastor. And um, just show the, 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 the one for formation of a zone. Yeah. So now you have missional community leaders. You have DG leaders who are now the second generation leaders. And then you've got the people they're raising. And so this thing is now growing. So... It's, it's, it's a powerful model because nobody's being forced to be a leader. It's just as people come and join your groups, you're growing. And that's how the kingdom expansion happens because everybody is a multiplying uh, piece. And it's not you doing the multiplication, it's your people doing the outreach as you're discipling them. Now, here's a fun thing about this thing. For that discipleship, for that zone or pastor, the people that he's discipling or she's discipling, the MC leaders, are the original guys that were in your group. It's not like you're now getting 50 guys that you're discipling. You're still discipling the five or the seven that were in your group. It's just that now you've moved up and they've moved up. So your span of care doesn't grow. Your span of care remains, I disciple you, so you disciple your people. And what that means is my, my, my life never gets too full. If I have five, six people that I care for, we've built a family, we still continue being a family with those people. And I'm I may be leading a thousand people, but I'm leading them through my group. So right now, as a, as, a, as a discipleship group leader, the people I lead are my executive team. I don't, have, I don't lead other groups. Because if I lead these guys well, and they lead their people well, this church will be led well. So we're saying you don't actually have to have, like your group is growing, now you have 50 people that are reporting to you. It doesn't work that way. It's there's always people that are reporting to the people that you're leading. So I think that's one of the things that makes this uh, work so well. So... Uh, let, me, th let me just talk about the last thing, which is, the, what, okay, you, you can't see it very well, but it says that the movement rhythm's there. So how, do, how, does this, how does discipleship continue when you've started your own group? And this is a, an, an example of how it could work. This is not yet set in stone, but this is an example of how it could work eventually. So Tuesday morning, the campus pastor meets his zonal leaders or her zonal leaders. Uh, zonal leaders are the people leading uh, sections of the church. Uh, by the time I have zonal leaders, Pastor Kevin, you have four zonal leaders. Uh, one of them is Pastor Faith, uh, who is sitting next to you, and she leads the zone that the two of you are responsible for. The other is, are they here? Omboy, if you could stand. Omboy and Simon, uh, please stand. And then, is Nyamu here? I'm kind of throwing people under the bus here. I didn't want them, so they might have gone to the bathroom. Okay. 
and then and there's Nash. and Nash. So those are his four. Those are the the, the I think there are seven, huh? Because Nash is single. Yes. But but the others, are, and it's your job to help him find a good wife, by the way, because you're his spiritual father. Yeah, you have to be concerned about that. He mar he's such a missional guy. You want him to marry somebody who's missional. By the way, we have an amazing young man. How old is he? <laughs> 20. <laughs> he needs to find 25. He, he needs to find a good wife because he's such a missional guy, such a godly man. So if there's a good candidate in the room, uh, talk to Pastor Kevin. So, so those are Pastor Kevin and his, his leaders. Now for Pastor Kevin and Faith, that's who they pour into. That's who they're concerned about. That's who comes to their house and knows their house inside out. That's who they hang out with. Of course, there are other people who hang out with them, but these are the guys that they focus a lot of their attention. They're trying to make these guys to be them, which then means inevitably you guys are going to lead a campus. You know that, isn't it? Yeah, it's just, it's inevitable because to be like him, you're going to end up doing that. But you're the zonal leaders under him. And each of them has a, a region that they're looking after that has um, missional co communities. How many discipleship groups are you guys looking after right now? Four discipleship groups. Our faith, how many are you looking after? Eight. Eight. And then how many is Nyamu looking after? Eight. Eight as well. And then uh, Nyamu and Joe. Yes, Nyamu and Joe. And then uh, Nash has how many groups right now? Nine. Nine groups. So each of those guys now has groups that are under them. That's, we're talking about that being the, the level. Thanks, guys. You can sit. So that becomes a level that is called the, MC, the, the zone. Each zonal pastor has missional community leaders. Now, the zonal pastors all report to the campus pastor because the campus pastor is the, is the person in charge of groups in their church. So each of those discipleship group leaders now has a group that they're growing to start their own groups. And that's how the system then works. Now the beauty of this system, it doesn't require serious Bible theologians. It doesn't require people who've been Christians for 20 years. In fact, sometimes the people who've been saved shortest do best. Because we know how we get mixed up. We start... We start uh, questioning and we start becoming harder to lead the, the longer we've been in the Lord, especially if we've been used to sitting down and doing nothing. And so, so it's just one of those things. I think it's a posture of willingness to learn that helps this system, uh, this, this thing grows. Every week, uh, okay, what do they talk about? What do you talk about when you're discipling people? I'm going to talk about that in another session. But you're continuing to disciple them and help them grow spiritually. So I'm concerned about Pastor Milton's spiritual growth. Uh, he may be a pastor in this church, but I'm concerned about him and Pastor Vivian, and I want to see that they're growing in the Lord. Um, if I see things that are not uh, toward or helping him that goal, I'm the person, nobody else can call him out, by the way. I'm the one who will call him out. And so I have, I'm, I'm, with these guys, I've earned the right to speak in their lives. I hope I have. And I'm able to challenge them and say, guys, I need you to grow. I can see an area you need to grow in. Um, but also I celebrate. I call out of them the gifts. That's another role of a disciple. I call out of them the things that God is doing. And I help them to grow. And we are learning something in church. I want them to apply it in their lives. I want to see evidence in their lives. That's what you do as a discipler. Your job is to help them grow spiritually. Number two, um, another thing that you talk about with your disciples is you want to hear about their disciples. So every time we meet, I ask them questions about, so how, how your discipleship group, your zonal leaders doing? What's happening? So I get, in fact, my job is to know the names of their discipleship group leaders, at least their second generation. That's how I know my boy and Simon so well, because he talk, he boasts about you guys all the time. Uh, and that's, that's, that's the way it's meant to be. It's because I want to know, your, I guess they're my grandkids. So at least I, if I don't know all my great grandchildren, I should, I should, I should at least know my grandkids. So that's, that's now um, how, how this is happening. Number, number three, continue to help them grow in their skills and their leadership. When they're stuck somewhere, I help unstuck them. And then we're always discussing what God is doing in the movement, what they're hearing. I, want to, I always want to know, what are you hearing God saying? Because I also lead through them. They also help me hear what God is saying. So when you're leading your people, this is, this is what you do with your disciples. These are the conversations that you have with them. Anybody feeling intimidated by this conversation so far, by the way? Okay. Okay. A few people. Yeah, yeah. No, there's a few people who are like, oh my God, this is so much work. I didn't know this is what I was meant to be when I'm a discipleship group leader. But trust me, guys. In the context of relationship, in the context of family, you have fun when you're leading. If you love your people, if you become not just a group that meets, but you become a family together on mission, you'll actually love these people so much, you'll enjoy seeing Christ being formed in them. You won't even have to be told that that's your job. Um, now, each week, our discipleship group leaders, uh, have we designed the report? 
We do have a regular report. Uh, we are working on it. As we are working on it, why don't you just share how many people came and how many, what questions arose? Okay. So right now there's just a Google form, and we want every discipleship group, we want to standardize it. So every discipleship group that meets, there's just the leader or the, the person they appoint fills out. And by the way, we encourage every leader to have an apprentice. So you don't have to be, learn to delegate from day one. <laughs> so something like reporting, get your apprentice to do it. Uh, so at every time we meet, how many, how many were you? What are the issues that came up? Is somebody being appointed uh, an apprentice just now? <laughs> I had someone laughing nervously. <laughs> and then, <laughs> so the discipleship group leaders have a report. They send it to their MC leader, and then there's an MC leader report that compiles those, sends to, and it's sent to the zonal leader and the campus pastor. And then once a season, you have a party. So you have fun when you go out to reach the community, but at least once a season, once every uh, four months, you should have one meeting that is just, let's dance. Let's, our master was the master of the party. Jesus, I mean, until the Pharisees came and said, what's up with you, dude? When do you fast? Like the guy just had, he knew how to have fun. Let's never get too serious about this thing. Uh, heaven is a place of joy. Some of you will get to heaven and you'll be shocked. Like you'll, be, you'll have to be working your muscles because you're so used to not smiling. You thought that being saved was about being serious. Uh, heaven, Jesus laughed a lot. So we have to have at least a, one, once, have somebody who just creates a plot once, a, once every, at least once a season. All your groups come together in your MC and you have a party. And that's a great opportunity for the MC leader to speak, to impart, to teach something that will bless, uh, will bless God's people. Um, and last thing I'll say on this one is, eventually when you have 100 people, the zone gets promoted and becomes a campus. Yeah. But then some of you are going to plant a campus without even knowing you've started it. Like your zone will just grow because of the people who are following you. And it's just you being faithful. And all of a sudden you find we're actually leading a campus and we'll commission you. And I'm so excited about that. I'm looking forward to seeing God doing this. Uh, one, like I said, the, 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 when, when I look at um, Pastor Milton, is a, his, his sister is a pastor in RCCG. And she didn't set out to be a pastor. What's her profession? She's a HR professional. She's a HR professional. So this RCCG guys came from Nigeria, started their church, started doing discipleship like this. So she just started leading. And the other day she actually got commissioned by... Reverend Adeboe, to be a pastor. Uh, I'm like, what? She never saw herself as a pastor. But it's just happened naturally. And now she's leading people. Isn't that amazing? Wow. Come on, Pastor Milton. Yeah. Family of pastors. I love it. <laughs> now, listen, guys. This thing about being a pastor, don't, don't ever get it twisted. God's job for you is to multiply. Be fruitful. Multiply. Fill the earth with your disciples. I know maybe nobody ever told you that's part of the job description. When you say, Jesus, come into my life, all you're thinking about is fire insurance. I don't want to go to hell. <laughs> but the contract you were signing that day was, I will be fruitful, I will multiply, and I will fill the earth. Every one of us. And my prayer is that none of us will enter heaven alone, smelling of smoke. That every one of us will have a retinue behind us. There will be people, hundreds of people, that were impacted by the people I impacted. I don't have to be Billy Graham. Very few people are like that. You can get 1,000, 10,000 people into a stadium and bring them to Christ. That's, that's not what God is calling us to be. He's just asking you, Jesus had only 12. Even Jesus had only 12. Maybe you might say, okay, I'm not Jesus, I'll have six. <laughs> but even those six, if you disciple them and they disciple others, you will enter heaven with hundreds behind you. Yeah, yeah fathers with six children. Any of you, maybe you grew up in a family with just even four children. You find a whole clan comes out of those four daughters and four sons. Yeah. You'll have your clan in heaven. And there'll be a place named after you, the Onen clan. It'll be there. (laughs) And it's like, my goodness, these are all the children. Maybe they'll have a sector for you guys and your children. Because, you know, as you are, so so will your children be. So if you guys are worship leaders, your place will just be the party central of heaven. I mean, how do you have a husband and a wife who are both worship leaders? That section has to be just worship section. (laughs) So, So guys, this is what God wants for us. Now, some of you are at the place where you're thinking, man, I'm such a young person. Man, I'm such a young Christian. Man, I'm, I'm, I'm even, I don't even know myself, this thing well. How will I be expected to lead others? Listen, that's the beauty of this thing. God isn't looking for qualified people. God qualifies the called. Yeah, he calls you, then he qualifies you. And he just doesn't, he doesn't want you to try and be something you're not. He's going to use the gifts you have. 
Some of you, your gift is cooking chapati. That gift is what will make that group grow. People will just feel at home because of that gift. That's all he needs, is for you to be able to put what you have in your hands into his hands. And God is asking, what do you have in your hands? I just want to use that. Some of you are interested in watching sports. That's what's going to grow your group together. Maybe that's what you guys will be doing when you meet. It's like, let's have a plot and just watch soccer. Let's watch Formula One. Let's watch something fun. And that grows the group. God will grow the things he's already... God has already given you everything you need to be fruitful, to multiply, and to fill the earth. Every one of us. And so, guys, this is, this is, a, this is the smallest we'll ever be. Amen. This is the least you will ever be. Amen. Yeah. Abraham's promise. You're a child of Abraham. He said, you will have children who will fill the earth. You will have children like the sons on the seashore. You remember how we used to sing, Father Abraham? And who are you? You're one of them, isn't it? Yes! That promise is for you. Your children will feel that they'll be like the suns, they'll be like the stars in the sky. And Abraham had <laughs> two sons. Actually, he only had two sons. We sing many sons. But why do we sing many sons? Because his sons multiplied. And those sons multiplied. And those sons multiplied. And here we are today. That's your destiny in Christ Jesus. Sumit, I see many, many children. God is going to lead you to have a mighty nation behind you. Amen. You're a disciple already. And you will have adults and children because you're so gifted with children as well. This is one of those guys kids love. I don't even know. I get so annoyed when I see them around him. They don't come around me like that. You're a pastor, sir. And God is going to use you to bless many. Amen. Amen. Yeah. Let me just ask that we'll stand up for a second. We're going to have tea. But even before we do that, I just want us to just receive God's word. Receive this word. The Bible says, receive that word and you shall prosper. So just begin to say, Lord, I will be fruitful. I will, be, I will multiply. I will fill the earth and I will subdue it. Hey, come on, you're an ancestor. Begin to call out those blessings on yourself. Speak over your children. They are blessed because you're blessed. Lord, give me children. Give me people who will follow me. Help me to be a good parent, spiritual parent. Lord, help heaven be, more, be filled with people that I impact. Father God, may many people fill that space. Lord, you left me on earth for this one reason, to fill heaven and to populate heaven. Lord, I pray that you would use me. Use me to bring many people to you. Give me a zeal to see people come to you. Make me a disciple of nations. I'm asking you for nations, Lord. Make me a disciple of nations. Lord, I don't want to just be one of those people who died and went to heaven by themselves, smelling of smoke. Lord, I want to be a disciple. I want to be a changer of nations. Lord, I thank you for every man here, every woman here, every young person who's in this place. And I thank you that, Lord Jesus, you're pouring your Holy Spirit. We've already seen it, Lord. You're pouring your Holy Spirit on us like you did in the book of Acts. Miracles and signs and wonders are already happening and they will continue to happen, Lord. But Lord, I also thank you that when the book of Acts, when the Holy Spirit came, the church was sent out to preach and the gospel was taken into all the world. And Father God, I thank you that the world will be changed because of us. Hey, I speak over you that you will have children in continents you've never gone to. Yeah, yes. You'll be invited by your children in other continents to visit. People you didn't even know because your children had other children. This is your destiny in Christ Jesus. Your family will be great indeed. Some of you, by the way, it will be children that God is calling you to disciple. Praise God. Because those children are going to become mighty men and women. Hey, never despise anybody. Don't despise even a small child. If that's who God is calling you to start a group with, start it. Because those children will open doors for you. You'll be amazed. You'll be proud of them. And so Father, I just release now an anointing for discipleship. I release an, a, a love for spiritual children. A love for fruitfulness. A love for multiplication. Lord, I pray over your children that they, they will not be content with being mediocre. None of us will be content to just live for ourselves anymore. I speak over your people that, Lord, you will give them skill to bring up people, integrity of heart to bring up people, to, to show people the way. And I pray that because of the people in this room, the world will never be the same. Even those who are watching online, the world will never be the same. And so I bless you, God's children, in the name of Father, Son, Holy Spirit. God's people say it together. Amen. 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 Amen.